Thank you. Clerk Segers, can you please take a roll call? Trustee Borninski. Good evening. I'm here in Canton Township. Trustee Foster. Good evening. I'm here in Canton Township. Trustee Ganguly. Good evening. I'm here in Canton Township. Supervisor Graham Hudak. Good evening. Here in Canton Township. Let the record reflect that Clerk Segrist is in attendance as well. Uh, Trustee Snydeman. I am also here. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Just to let everybody know, we are saying where we are because this is a hybrid meeting. And so we are stating that we are in Canton Township. So can I have a motion to adopt the agenda with the addition of item G15, which is consider waiving the bidding process and approve the installation of temporary fencing around the public safety generator. So moved. Support. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Can I hear a motion to approve the minutes for August 10th, 2021? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion approved. Next yeah. we have public- Madam Supervisor, can I, are we doing all um, voice votes or a roll call? Yes, voice votes. Um, Diane Slavens, who's not here, said she probably wouldn't be able to come. So if okay. she comes, she'd just be a spectator. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Thank you. So we will now do public comment. Public comment is for a three minute comment. You can please state your name and whether you're a resident or a business, it's for three minutes. And if we have any, if we have to get back to you about something, we can do that. So should we start online to see if we have any public comments, any hands raised? Okay, we're just sort of starting online. Do you see anything online? I see nobody who has raised their hand or indicated that they would like to make public comments online. Okay, go ahead, sir. Go ahead. How are you doing? I'm Rich Keenan. I'm just a citizen of Canton. I was here two weeks ago when I just stole the same question is, I know that between the townships, et cetera, there's been various amounts of money has been dumped into the townships as there's been not in 2019 and 2020, no fireworks in Canton. I'm just wondering what we're doing to track what hasn't been done to see that it's not being carried over year to year, it may be, but the question is, is it any year what's being spent, and what brought it up was literally the deputy supervisor's position, what's being addressed to, to make sure that the dollars for the budgets are being followed as compared to, you know, money that's being allocated to certain things where Biden can say they, they can be used for anything, they can't be used for anything. He's saying that this was passed for you know, the Rebuild America plan or something else, and he's using it for whatever. And I'm just trying to make sure that on an overall basis we're tracking where the dollars are going for Ken. Okay, thank you, Mr. Keenan. Um, if you want, you can call my office and we can go over that again. Like, okay, thank you. Any other comments, public comments? Nope, anybody on online again? Public comments, public comments, public comments. All right, thank you. Next item on the agenda, can I have a motion to pay the bills, please? So moved. Support. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Well, I'm proud to say our next item on the agenda are presentations. We had some interns this year come in over the summer, and they're going to be doing their presentations to us of some of the work that they've done for the township while they've been here. Um, they will go planning, supervisor's office, and then engineering. They'll talk about what they've been doing, um, and they'll give a little bit of introduction to themselves also as they come up. So first up, we have... From the planning group, Ashley, Amy, Maggie Huntley, Christine Ross, and Grace Whitney. You can come up to the podium and we have your slides up there. If you want to just talk, uh, just give a little introduction each of you for yourselves. All right, good evening, everybody. We're the four planning interns. We've been working here since the beginning of May. And tonight we're going to share with you guys a little bit about ourselves and the projects we've been working on. My name is Grace Whitney. I received my Bachelor's of Science in Earth and Environmental Sciences 
from Wright State University down in Dayton, Ohio. Right now, I am about to start my second year of my master's in urban and regional planning at Eastern Michigan. I'm originally from Emily City, which is in the Thumb area. My favorite hobby is playing tennis. I'm currently on the women's tennis team at Eastern Michigan. Hello, my name is Maggie Huntley. Uh, I got my bachelor's in urban and regional planning at Michigan State. I am also a current master's student at Michigan State for the planning program. I'm from the Ipsy Ann Arbor area and my hobby involves coaching gymnastics. Good evening, my name is Christine Ross. I um, just recently graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from Eastern Michigan University. Um, this fall, I will be attending Wayne State University to kick off my master's in urban planning degree. I am originally from Grand Rapids and my hobbies include gardening and taking care of houseplants. Hello, I'm Ashley Amy, and I'm currently attending Eastern Michigan University, pursuing my um, bachelor's in regional and urban planning with a minor in sustainability. Um, I've lived in Canton Township my whole life. I was born and raised here, and my favorite co hobby is kayaking. So. Um, over the course of the summer, we've had a good bunch of common tasks that we've all kind of collectively done which includes site plan reviews, assigning addresses, landscape and site inspections, file digitization, zo uh, certificates for zoning compliance, reviewing zoning ordinance and master plans for the future updates, and preparing zoning confirmation letters. Next slide, please. You guys are doing a great job. Get a little bit closer to the microphone because we want to hear you. Oh, you want me closer? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Thank um, you. So I worked on, mainly worked on the sidewalk and trails gap analysis project. Um, the larger map that you see there is the whole township detailing the existing gap and pending um, sidewalks in the township. Um, the smaller image is just kind of a zoomed in approach because it's a little hard to see. There's a lot going on on the big map, but it highlights section 21, which is where we currently are. Um, you can see it's showing the uh, Heritage Park area. Uh, the first table that you see um, details the total mileage for pending gap in existing sidewalk. Um, the next two tables, um, collectively we went around the township giving a ranking for each of the sidewalk gaps um, for constructability and usefulness, giving it a one, two, or three. So for constructability, it's easy, medium, and hard constructability. For usefulness, it's most useful, medium use, and least useful. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this summer, I've been working with our tree inventory that we have in the township. In 2019, the previous planning interns went around and took an inventory of street trees that are located along major roads in township parks and on municipal property, so mostly most of the trees that are under the management of the township. I've been managing and organizing this data so that we can use it to plan for pruning, removal, and planting. It also helps us gauge the benefits that the trees provide the township, like stormwater retention, carbon storage, air filtration, temperature regulation for adjacent buildings, and increasing property values. So this is an example of a calculation that can be done using the National Tree Benefit Calculator that's through the National Arbor Society. Um, these tree benefits, you can use them to calculate yearly benefits for one tree based on species, location, and size. So this is an example of a 20-inch white oak on a residential property, and there's a pie chart that indicates um, what it provides in dollar amount for different types of natural benefits. And this tree in particular provides $199 in benefits every year. So there are 8,209 trees in the inventory, and I went through and did that for each of those trees. And in total, they provide over $600,000 in annual benefits. In 2021, we're planning to remove all the dead trees and stumps that we have in the inventory and prepare a plan for future planting to maximize the value of the trees in the coming years. All right, so the Redevelopment Ready Communities Program is administered through the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, or MEDC for short. So RRC is a voluntary, no-cost, statewide certification program that was established to promote and support communities through all development um, procedures and processes. So this program aims to identify and engage community stakeholders, attract new businesses, 
and streamline the development process for, for everyone involved. Um, so this summer, I helped initiate the RRC program for Canton Township, um, and I completed several tasks requ required for the six best practices. The six best practices are um, plans and engagement, so that works with um, updating the master plan, um, creating a capital improvements plan, a corridor plan, and um, a public participation plan. Um, best practice two is zoning, and that helps with alignment with the master plan and any updates that would be necessary. Um, best practice three is development review. That is more of an internal process to help with um, streamlining, um, tracking, and um, joint meetings. Best practice four is boards and commissions. Um, so you would help to adopt bylaws and um, establish me <laughs> joint meeting procedures. Um, best practice five is economic development. So that would be to create an economic development strategy and some marketing plans. And best practice six is establishing <clears throat> priority redevelopment sites. Um, and within um, certification, there is technical assistance match funding, and that is grants for um, certain RRC projects. Um, I've done a bit of research on electric vehicles um, or EVs. Um, I'm just going to gloss over it a bit because the supervisors, interns are going to go into uh, more detail. Um, but as EVs rise in popularity, the township should consider making steps to incorporate EV charging stations and related infrastructure. Um, there are three types of EVs. There are hybrid EVs, HEVs, plug-in hybrid EVs, FEVs, and battery EVs, um, BEVs. And uh, FEVs, um, FEVs and BEVs are classified as plug-in EVs or also known as PEVs. So there are also three types of chargers. There's the level one chargers, which charge two to five miles per one hour of charging, typically used for overnight or residential parking. Level two is 10 to 20 miles per one hour of um, charging. It's best for public and workplace settings. And DC fast charging or level three um, is 60 to 80 miles per one hour of charging, and they're great for sites along heavy traffic areas. Um, according to SEMCOG, uh, a about 0.59% of registered vehicles in Michigan are EV, um, making about 15,649 vehicles um, plug-in EVs. These numbers are increasing. Um, they're estimated to be about 600,000 to 100, I mean 1 million EV vehicles by 2030. So that would make up about 6 to 11% of Michigan vehicles. Thank you very much. A lot of great news, thank you. The next um, we have Mark Madam Loudon. Supervisor, yes. can I just make a oh, comment? Oh sure, actually, that's a good idea, I'm sorry. Yeah, Would you no mind problem. coming back up? We have some questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, great presentation, and I see you've done some great work this summer, all of you, and it's gonna benefit the community. I hope working here has benefited you towards your careers, so um, congratulations on all you did. The one comment I wanted to make is the um, sidewalk committee, which ad hoc committee has been meeting. I've been attending those meetings. And um, I think it was Maggie, is that right? Who did the sidewalks? Great name, that's my daughter's name as well. <laughs> and um, it was really useful to have the work that you did, um, all of you on the sidewalks, because um, we were really able to start discussions. And Patrick, you were there at the last one, we were really uh, able to start discussions on, yes, there's 50 miles of sidewalk gaps in our community. I had no idea. It's something I've been talking about for nine years, but I had no idea how many, so thank you for that. It's really been helpful in the discussions, and there's gonna be, in the coming year, a lot of sidewalk discussion amongst us, so I'm looking forward to having that. So thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Next, we have Mark Loudon and Aaron McCarger. Hello. All right. 
it's working. Hi, so um, this is our presentation about electric vehicle infrastructure in Canton. Um, next slide. So we are the interns from the supervisor's office. My name is Erin, and I'm about to pursue a Master of Public Administration from Eastern Michigan University. My favorite hobbies include salsa dancing, gardening, and juggling. My name is Mark Loudon, and I recently graduated from the University of Michigan Dearborn with a degree in mechanical engineering. Some of my favorite hobbies are longboarding, playing guitar, and yo-yoing. Any questions about hobbies, you can ask <laughs> at the end. <laughs> so I just wanted to go over some general uh, benefits of electric vehicles. Uh, they're sustainable. They have 70% lower emissions than gas-powered vehicles, not including renewable energy. They have lower noise pollution. They're cost-effective. They save about $4,500 in maintenance over the, cost, over the life of the vehicle. And uh, they increase energy security, especially when they're paired with um, renewable, renewable energy. And we just have a quote here that shows that um, many consumers want to buy EVs, but one of the main barriers that they cite is a lack of adequate charging infrastructure that's holding them back. Next slide, please. So Ashley already spent some time talking about the different types of levels of EV charging, but one thing I'll go over real quick is just the t different kinds of connectors. Generally, for level one and level two, you have the standard J1772. But with DC fast chargers, you have three different connectors. There's CCS, Chade, Mo, and Tesla. And so Tesla is straightforward. Tesla cars use it. And then the CCS is usually North American manufacturers. And the Chade, Mo is mostly Asian manufacturers. Next slide, please. Um, so just a little bit about the current state of EVs and market trends. Um, so on the national level in 2019, the PEVs were 2% of light duty vehicle sales in the US. Uh, last year in Michigan, there were about 15,000 EVs on the road, but this could increase to around 600,000 to 1 million by 2030. Um, and on the local level, as of last year, there were 767 EVs in Canton. Um, and also some of the, or, or many of the major um, manufacturers, including General Motors, Ford, Stellantis, they've committed to changing or converting to EV uh, sales very soon. GM has committed by 2035 to do a complete transition. So it's happening faster than many of us thought. And these are a few incentives and rebates that are available for EV chargers, DTE, provides $500 per charger for residential customers and $2,500 for business customers. So Canton would be eligible for that if Canton were to buy its own chargers. Um, Eagle also has a program for level three chargers, but that isn't relevant in Canton at the moment because there are no eligible locations. And there are some uh, fleet incentive programs that are coming soon from the state of Michigan and uh, DTE. So in addition to all this, we also spent some time looking at where the ideal locations for charges would be in Canton. And so one of the quotes we have is, as much as 85% of charging happens at home usually, but there are still gaps that need to be filled, mostly at multi-residential housing and hotels where people are either spending overnights and they need their car charged. So the tricky thing is how can Canton support that? And so we also looked at public buildings, park and recreations, Places, especially in this area, Heritage Park, you have the Summit Library, um, these softball fields. They're good locations for people who are just needing to spend time charging their vehicle. It can take up to four to five hours to charge a vehicle. So providing this option for people who otherwise couldn't have an EV charger just opens up the accessibility to owning an EV. And so we also spent some time comparing what other municipalities are doing. And this is just a graph to give some general information and the big takeaway is that Ann Arbor, Ferndale, and Grand Rapids, what they're doing is they are pla strategically placing their chargers where they can charge for parking. So you park and you give them a fee and then you can basically charge your vehicle for free. Next slide please. So but Westland and Northville, what they're doing is they're partnering with companies and splitting revenue made from the machines themselves, which is what we're going to recommend Canton does. So just an overview, Westland is working with a New Jersey-based company called Greenspot and is receiving 5% of the revenue, while Northville is working with a Detroit-based company called Hague Automotive and receiving 10% of the revenue. Uh, so another thing we did was compare zoning ordinances in, in Michigan. 
Um, 27 zoning, or zoning ordinances mention EVs in Michigan, and four cities actually require EV infrastructure and new developments. Um, this is just some terminology. EV ready refers to just having the conduit laid for a charger, and EV installed means having an actual charger installed with the conduit. So some examples are Grand Rapids and Ann Arbor. Grand Rapids has less stringent requirements. It's basically one EV space per 200 parking spaces. Ann Arbor has much more strict requirements. I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, some other cities also recommend rather than require EV infrastructure. Roseville is one of those. And then a final thing is that um, some cities have chosen to allow EV spaces to count as multiple regular parking spaces in their minimum parking requirements, which is a great idea to incentivize placing the chargers and, um, and lowers the cost for developers. So more about Ann Arbor here. Uh, so as I said, it's a pretty strict ordinance. Um, generally requires about 10% of parking to be EV installed with a charger and around 10 to 25% to be EV capable, which is similar to EV ready. Um, and in July, a Catholic church was expanding their parking lot and appealed this uh, ordinance because it would have been extremely expensive. They would have had to install a lot of chargers. Um, and they won the appeal and reduced the number to about 10 spaces with EV infrastructure. So this is just something to consider if Canton were to do something like this, that there could be pushback. Um, so here are some recommendations. So some of the first steps that Canton has already begun taking is they've already issued an RFP to basically choose a vendor similar to what Westline and Canton are doing. And vendors will be submitting their bids and they're going to be looking to negotiate with these different rep, uh, vendors. Also in the works is an application for a SEMCOG grant that would help pay for the surveying costs so it wouldn't be any extra cost to the citizens. And then finally, a technology committee is being formed by the township supervisor, Anne Marie, and they're basically going to continue this effort in trying to implement EV chargers in Canton. Um, so one long-term goal that Canton could consider would be to update their zoning ordinance. Um, importantly, allow level two and level three chargers in all zones with some stipulations. And there's a lot of information on this in our notes that we shared. Um, so another thing Canton could consider would be to establish infrastructure requirements. I have a table here that has some percentages that I thought would be feasible here because they're not so strict, like places like Ann Arbor, but they still uh, incentivize and, and kind of push for the infrastructure. And they place a uh, priority on multifamily homes and hotels because that's where it'll be most needed. And then um, Canton could also consider uh, playing around with the parking minimums to include, to incentivize EV spaces. And also site design, some site design requirements would be good to include, in, like trip hazards, protective bollards, signage. And there, like I said, there's a lot more information in the notes. There was really too much to write <laughs> on one slide. Next slide, please. And so here we just have some examples of a, a parking space at Consumers Energy. As you can see, they've clearly designated the spot as EV parking only. It has green paint, it's got bollards. It even has the signage. And to the right of that picture are just different examples of signs that we've seen all over. Right now, there's not one regulatory sign, like a handicap sign, for instance. But generally, what's recommended is having some kind of symbol, symbol that will um, <laughs> basically communicate to a potential EV driver that this is a spot for them and will co communicate to non-EV drivers that they are not allowed to park in the space. And so part of the long-term goals is we've developed a list of places that we think are best suited for Canton. The, I mentioned earlier this whole area, which includes the administration building, the library lot, the summit, there's even a splash park, and even the village cultural area where they have the theater. It could become a good walking area for consumers. And then the Canton Sports Center is also just a highly foot-trafficked area, lots of parking space available. And right now, already, the conduit is laid down for Canton Fire Station 2. And so as you can see, it's got the necessarily bollards, but it doesn't have a sign yet. It doesn't have parking to distinguish it. But it's basically get in the, the preemptive zone of having a charger installed there. And here's just a map of these locations. Very hard to read from the slide, so we won't <laughs> go too in detail. But all that is is just high and low priorities of the locations I already listed off. Um, another long-term goal would be to electrify the township fleets, which is already in process with the seven hybrids that Canton ordered 
Um, but this is a cost-effective step. It makes a public image for EVs, and there are lots of resources available, including a couple uh, rebate or grant programs coming soon that could be utilized. And just finally, a couple other, oh, next slide. Um, <laughs> a couple other ideas that CAN could consider would be streamlining the permitting process for EV chargers. This could be as simple as a checklist or YouTube video, reduced fees or uh, expedited review. And then education and outreach is also extremely important, especially for developers, because this is a fast transition and for them to understand why it's important to include this infrastructure. Um, a rebate program for multi-unit dwellings could be considered. There's information in our notes. There's an example from Columbus, Ohio that you all can look at if you want. And then finally, creating a sustainability and climate action or climate action plan would create a backdrop for all of this sustainability work and set a good direction for Canton in general. Um, and that's all. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Kate? Hi, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, from, from all of the interns so far, um, and I'm sure the next one will be great too. But um, I'm actually uh, an EV driver. I've driven one now for almost two years. And um, I was just wondering, um, on the slide that you had about the state and local incentive programs, um, what, what is disqualifying Canton from the Charge Up Michigan program? You said there were no eligible locations or something? Yeah, that program is for level three chargers only, the fast chargers. So, and they actually picked out, they did a study and they picked out specific locations in Michigan where the chargers could be placed. So there is one location in Michigan, it's on Ford, or sorry, in Canton, it's on Ford Road um, and it's already spoken for. I think it's a BP station. So they've already gotten the funding. And as of now, they, there are no other locations in Canton that, so, so basically Canton can't apply. Okay, all right, thank you for explaining that. Tanya. Thank you so much for the presentation. This is a cause very close to my heart. Um, so I have a question about, you know, have you done any um, research on how we can encourage like local businesses, especially IKEA being our high traffic, you know, a lot of people come every day to IKEA parking lot and how, um, I think there might be some charging stations there, but how do we uh, encourage local businesses, um, even hotels that already are built to have an EV charging station? Um, are, you know, is it at the state level, are they giving some incentives? How can we encourage them? Yeah, I think the, the DTE program definitely helps because um, they would qualify for that $2,500 rebate um, but also, and uh, I think on the last slide I mentioned, uh, like any um, expedited, yeah, expediting the permitting process, just any way you can make it easier for businesses to do this. Um, yeah, lowering the fee or just creating a process that's really straightforward or, or education and outreach, helping them, just giving them the tools to do it um, is what's gonna make a difference there because obviously can't, you can't really force anyone to, to install a charger. So it's just making the process as, as easy as possible. We also included the idea of like, for any new development for businesses, having EV charger parking sp spaces count for either more or less, depending on how many they want. Yeah, and that would be for new development yeah. mostly, like if they want to expand, but that's also really helpful, yeah. Questions? Quick question and a comment. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. I thought it was excellent. Um, Trustee Snyderman, um, Supervisor Graham Hudak, and I um, participated in interviews for folks interested in participating on the Technology Committee. And there is a lot of excitement and energy around these issues of technology and sustainable in our community. Um, is this something, this presentation, something that the committee members will be able to have access to or be able to see some of the notes that have been put together? Definitely, we actually created a SharePoint just for that, and they put a lot of information in, and all the interns will put information in that SharePoint. So you as the board can see that, and the technology committee. Yes, thank you, good question. Thank you. I have a lot of notes. <laughs> so, well, judging by the people that we interviewed, I'm sure that they will, <laughs> they will definitely love to take a look at it. Madam Supervisor, uh -huh. okay. um, how would 
the trustees access that SharePoint? I believe they already have their name on. Is that we just have to send the link? Is that correct? Yeah, I set it up with IT. I think you should have access, but I can check. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to send them the link. We can do that. Yeah, we'll okay. check on it. Thank it's you. It's also a folder in the supervisor's drive, yeah, isn't it? It's, yeah. yeah, that's the SharePoint, yeah. Okay. And electric vehicle infrastructure, I think. Yeah. Make sure you, you have that link. All right, thank you very much. Good job. Our last group, we have one person virtual and one person here. So from our engineering group, Kyle Petruski and Andrew Houston. Andrew, I believe, is virtual. Afternoon, everybody. I'm Kyle Petruski, and yeah, I'll be joined by Andrew Houston uh, via Zoom. Andrew, you there? Him? Or do we have to promote him up here? Permission to talk? I don't see anybody by that name as an attendee. Oh, there we go. There. Sorry, Andrew. I'm going to promote him to panelist. Doc? All right, I'll just get into it. Um, so I'm going to do a, a little um, end of summer presentation about our internship here at uh, the township. Um, so a little overview first. We're going to start out with some introductions of Andrew and myself. Then we'll move on to our in the office and out of office experiences from this internship and some of the lessons and takeaways we learned from all the things that we have done throughout the summer. And then from there we'll go to questions. Good evening, everybody. A uh, quick test. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes. All righty. My name is Andrew Houston. I am currently studying general engineering at Michigan Tech, and that is where I am right now. I'm up in Houghton. I really enjoy being outside and keeping active. That's some of my hobbies. I also like to go fishing. And in the future, I hope to work on some large scale civil engineering projects. Once again, I'm Kyle Petruski. I am studying at Wayne State University, going into my senior year, and my major is civil engineering. In my free time, I like to play sports, volleyball, basketball with my friends, and fishing as well. Um, and one of my, one of the things I aspire to do is a major project, like a bridge or something in the future. All right, moving on, we'll touch on the in-office experiences. So a lot of the in-office things that we did uh, revolved around research, organization, and presentation of information. Um, uh, one of the first major projects we did was the EV charging stations, which you saw the previous interns kind of took the reins on that. We did a little bit of overview on the whole thing, industry leaders, um, some of the other chargers, and then passed it on to them and let them take the reins on it. Um, the next thing we touched on was I-275 crossings. We did an analysis of all of the uh, bridges that are crossing over um, I-275 I in Canton, mainly looking at the pedestrian crossings, uh, looking at the residents around it, um, pedestrian traffic, some of the businesses, whether they would need to have access there and seeing whether it warrants a either a better pedestrian crossing or one at all. Um, next, we touched on some of the sidewalk repair programs. This was mostly inputting information from previous sidewalk repair um, into the system. It was all mostly in paper, and that's not ideal to look back onto if a resident comes up and wants to look into their uh, property. So we put that, well, the majority of um, the 2019 uh, sidewalk crossing into the system. Um, and then beyond that, we did some other malicious requests. We looked at the sanitary systems and the water mains all along the main roads in Canton. And um, we compiled them all onto this big uh, map here. You can see it's in the corner there, kind of hard to see, but um, that has all the file names of the water main blueprints and sanitary system blueprints. So if a engineer needs to quickly get access to a blueprint, they can do that from that fairly easily. And then I included the drive uh, thing on there so you can, anybody wants to use that, they feel, feel free to. All right, on to the next one. So the out of office experiences. This we, um, so firstly, we uh, went out and looked at some of these sidewalk repair programs with a fellow engineer, Matt. Um, he had us look over and measure and 
see uh, exactly what is wrong with some of these sidewalks, see some of these standards for residential and um, industrial areas, got a good idea of what goes into the sidewalk repair program. Um, next, we also looked at some of the construction processes, went out into the field and saw how some of the residential developments happen. Um, we got to see, which is one of me and Andrew's favorite things, we got to see um, them put a little drone down into one of these sanitary sewer systems and see exactly what's through there. It's, it's not as big as you might think. It's not like uh, in the movies. <laughs> um, all right, on to the next one. So from some of uh, those big projects and other small things we did, some of the major takeaways we took from this internship over the summer is we got a better sight into an engineer's day-to-day -day work, exactly what they do, some of the smaller things that goes into the job of an engineer. We got a more in-depth process, or a more in-depth look into the process of a public project, the bidding, um, all the paperwork that goes into it, the contracting, maintenance, all the moving parts that are involved in a public project. Um, we also got some experience reading engineering plans and documents, blueprints especially. Those can be very intimidating at first glance, so um, we got to sit down and really learn what those entail. Um, and we got some real insight in the needs of maintaining a township. It's, it's a lot of work. Um, we got to see exactly all of the small things that pop up that the engineers need to take care of on a day-to-day -day basis. So that was good for us to, um, to see. All right, on to the next Q&A. So now we'll just open it up for questions, if anybody has questions for me and Andrew. A, a comment. Um, I, I love that uh, map with the um, file where you can click and get the file for the blueprints. I think that's awesome. Um, I can imagine that that is very helpful. So thank you for that. And thank you for all the work you did. And thank all of you interns. That, that this is great. Thank you. Other questions? Tanya. I have a question about your experience. Have you interned before in any other organization? Or? My freshman year, I did an internship at Michigan Cat. Um, it, this was definitely a better experience. That internship was a little more um, <laughs> geared towards sales, kind of. Uh, it was my freshman year, so I was just trying to get some experiences, you know. Um, I, I, I just wanted to know how, we, how your experience was being an engineer I, myself. And yeah, me, me and Andrew really enjoyed this summer. Um, I think he had an uh, internship as well prior to this, and he said this was one of his favorites as well. Yeah. Good answer, good answer. <laughs> so on your I-275 crossings, what did you learn there? What, what kind of work did you do? I should have included, um, we made a memo for uh, our higher up to look over and make the final decision on, but um, I, I think we summarized that um, the crossing on Copernic could use a pedestrian crossing, um, and Cherry Hill could use a pedestrian crossing too because that's just kind of a little uh, goat path there that people walk across the bridge. Any of the drainage, what did you learn about your drainage projects, the map you had? Drainage projects? So you want to put, can you flip forward or backwards, sorry. Um, let me see. I'm sorry, the Sidewalk repair? No, the marking map for, oh, it's one, one, one more back where you were. <laughs> where you marked the maps. What did you um, mark on those maps? Oh, um, this was, so um, this, we did this because the s previous system for looking into all the blueprints for the water mains and sewer or sanitary systems was very convoluted. Um, either it was the uh, files were named decently well or they were random characters. So we um, just, made the file names a little better, and we found them, marked them on that map, color-coded them, and then we scanned that into the system, and you can just click on that and zoom on to where you want to look at, kind of like how CityWorks is, um, and you can just easily find the file name for it, then go into the engineering where all the, those blueprints are and just go right to it, or just type it into the system. All right, thank you. Any other questions? No, well, thank you very much for your presentation. Would someone mind taking a picture of the group of the interns together so we can uh, let all the other employees see if you guys wouldn't mind standing in a group? Come on up here, actually. Come up here. Show proof that you were here presenting 
presenting to the board and the public. The yeah, you want to go up here in front of the flag? Uh, I have to leave them on, sorry. <laughs> we have your pictures, though. We have your pictures. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. <laughs> We do have one remote, so don't worry. We'll put your picture on also. We'll get you, Andrew. <laughs> thank you very much for your, thank you for all your, all your hard work and good luck in your um, classes this summer. This coming we'll semester. We'll Photoshop Andrew into yes. that photo. <laughs> put his head in. Good job. Great, thank you. Our next presentation is um, Director Wendy Trumbull. She's going to be talking about the American Rescue Plan Act. All right. Oh, did it start sharing the... Why isn't it going from the... Here it goes. Okay. Very good. Okay, the moment you guys have been waiting for. I have to pull this down a little bit so I can see without my glasses know, fogging up. I know they fog up, don't they? <laughs> so um, back in March, we were awarded, as you're all aware, you know, most of the entitlement communities, at least in Michigan, were awarded um, money from the federal government in response to the um, COVID uh, in order to help, you know, losses of revenue, if you will. Um, that communities received or in, were impacted by over the last year and a half or so. So in Canton, we were awarded um, $9.2 million, just shy of $9.2 million of this. So, you know, back in May, the federal government issued the guidance. So it was initially awarded in March. They had 60 days to give us the guidance. They gave us what they called the interim final guidance. So it's not final guidance. And they gave us there's about 150 pages of rules that you had to abide by. And at the end of each of the individual sections, it talked about, um, it talked about, it had a number of questions. So it would say, here's, here's some things that you could spend this on. But then it would say, ask questions. Well, what do you think about this? Or how long do you think we should allow governments to spend with these in these sorts of categories? And they wanted all the questions answered and responses by July. 10th, I think it was July 10th, July 16th, somewhere in that time frame. And since that time, they still have not issued their final guidance yet on answers on this. So um, this is, right now I'm going to talk about what we know today. Um, we don't necessarily have all the answers to all the questions yet, but we can give you the big highlights of what the, you know, the general rules are surrounding this, these grant dollars. So what we do know at this point in time is that the eligible use of the funds really fall into four categories. Uh, it can support public health expenditures. Those were also broken down into two subcategories. It can be responding to COVID-19 directly, or it can address negative economic impacts caused by this um, health emergency. The second big category is to replace the public sector lost revenue. The third is to provide premium pay for essential workers, and the fourth was to invest in water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. So I'm gonna go into each of those in a little bit more detail. Um, so the first category was to support the uh, public health expenditures. Um, and again, this is the one that was broken into the two major subcategories. So um, the first one is to foc focus on the funding of COVID-19 mitigation efforts. Uh, it can include medical expenses, behavioral health care, and certain public health and safety um, staff. So in the interim final guidance, I know one of the things that we've talked about um, quite a bit uh, it was behavioral health care. So it does state that behavioral health care includes mental health treatment, substance abuse, uh, or substance misuse treatment, and other uh, behavioral health services, um, crisis intervention, um, overdose prevention, and um, not to, that's just to name a few of them. So one of the things that we've talked about is the social workers and um, you know supporting mental health. That would be an eligible expense under this. For how long? It doesn't state in the guidance. You know, you could pay for that for a year. If it goes through 2024, it doesn't, it doesn't really state how long we can support that. 
at this point in time. That guidance hasn't been issued yet, but it is an eligible cost that we can support to, to, to pay. Um, the other piece of it, of this category, um, the second subcategory, is the economic harm to workers, households, small businesses, impacted industries, and the public sector. So the small businesses also includes not-for-profits. Uh, so not supporting not-for-profits falls under this category. So um, when I reference the FAQ, and I can send out links to these for, for, all of, for you guys to, to actually read if you want to see the more specific. I think the, I think the um, FAQs is 25, I can't remember if it was 25 or 42 pages of FAQs. <laughs> It's much shorter than the 150, but they do give some more specific, specific um, uh, answer, more specific questions. So um, this states the following, that for assistance to the small businesses, um, it may be provided to the small businesses, including loans, grants, in-kind assistance, um, technical assistance, or other services uh, to respond to the negative impacts of COVID. But it does state that recipients must design a program that responds to the negative economic impacts of COVID-19, including identifying how the program addresses the identified need faced by the small business. So further, um, there's really no definition, solid definition of what equals a small business, but they do give some guidance um, in this other FAQ. Um, it's um, targeted, there, you, we can consider additional criteria to target businesses, but one of the items that it references to is looking at the Small Business Administration. Um, they, they give a definition of what small businesses are. I don't have that definition off the top of my head, um, but something similar that was used for the um, Paycheck Protection Program. So small businesses were allowed to apply for certain other grants. So we would probably recommend following a similar program to how those programs were also initiated. Small businesses were also allowed to apply for grants through this ARPA grant through the federal government directly. This is basically just allowing Canton to also adopt those measures as well. So um, I forgot to say Mike Shepard, um, has, who has been uh, from finance, who has been integral in helping come up with this program and you know identify this is here. So we've been doing a lot of research. He's been doing a lot more research trying to, trying to look to what this would mean but there, again, has not been final guidance or final direction to really know how we would move forward with giving grants of this sort yet, but we're working on it. The second uh, major category here is to replace public sector lost revenue. So Canton Township's lost revenue calculation for 2020, and I put a little asterisk here because we still have a little bit of a question mark on um, one piece of it, um, is $5.6 million at a minimum. It might jump up to over $6 million um, if we can get some clarification from our auditors of um, one piece of the revenue that we're not sure if we can include or exclude yet. So it's interesting because the lost revenue calculation excludes certain revenues, includes certain revenues. So it excludes, um, your, you can't include your water revenue. That is excluded from this funding calculation but you include your sewer revenue. <laughs> so there's certain things that, you know, um, that you, that don't really make common sense on why you would include one and not the other. Um, you also exclude your federal grants. So if we already got, for example, we got a couple million dollars already from the state of Michigan last year and well, yeah, in 2020 for the payroll costs for May, we got about $2 million for that we exclude all that. So we can also say, our, we don't include that as a, a revenue that we received in 2020, we exclude that. So almost kind of double counting some of that. It doesn't actually look at our, where we ended up, where our bottom line was, is just looking at our revenue. So even though we made some measures to cut our expenses when we thought our revenues were gonna go down significantly, um, it doesn't look at, look at the bottom line, it just looks at the revenue. The good news about that is that we have significant flexibility on how we spend under this category of, um, of the section of the grant. So um, it basically gives us the, um, let's see, at the very bottom of this one, sorry, I was highlighting what we could spend it on here. Um, they gave several examples, which you could spend it on including infrastructure, which would be like roads, 
um, modernization of cybersecurity, including hardware, um, health services, environmental remediation. Um, basically, we have a lot of flexibility on how we spend this money. Sidewalk apps, um, it, you name it, we probably can spend it under, under this category as long as it's a government service. Um, like I said, we're still waiting on to hear back about the court revenue. So the court revenue in most communities runs through communities general funds. Um, the 35th district court is kind of lost out here in limbo because they aren't qualified to receive their own. They're, they're qualified to receive it through us, but under this definition, it doesn't address how we count their revenue, where if, if we were like any other municipality, the district courts go right through the general funds and we could count that as lost revenue. So we're trying to talk to the auditors to see from a common sense perspective, can they buy off on that from our audit to say that we can count that as our lost revenue. Um, I should further say that this lost revenue counts for 2021 as well. I fully expect that we will have more lost revenue for 21 based on the way the funding, the formula works. So you started out with our 2019 revenue and you add it by 4.1% and then you add that again by 4.1%. So we are likely going to finish under again this year and be able to make up for our whole grant, the whole $9.2 million could probably fall in this category, but we won't know that for sure until we're at the end of 21. Um, so there's a couple things that, um, that they talk about you cannot spend it on and you can't just use it to build up your reserves. So they don't want you to put it right into your fund balance and just use it for anything. You cannot use it to pay down your unfunded pension. However, it can be used to pay for unfunded OPEB costs or so unfunded um, retiree health care. I don't know why they said we could do one and not the other, but under the um, FAQs, they were very specific to say you could do it for, for one should the board choose to do that. The third category talks about providing premium pay for essential workers. Um, basically who, you know, um, who was here and who was required to be here um, because of the health, because of the pandemic. So it, specifically talks about the sanitation workers and it talks about um, public health and safety. So our DPW workers probably would fall under this category and obviously our, our police and fire personnel as well. However, we are somewhat limited um, because it states, if you see the bottom paragraph, and I'll provide this um, presentation to the, to the board as well, um, premium pay that would increase a worker's total pay above 150% of the greater of the state or county's average annual wage requires specific justification for how it responds to the needs. So likely if we were to give a premium, it's, they are, our workers would probably be 150% of the annual, already of the, of the base pay of the community. So we'd probably somewhat limited here uh, to be able to use these funds for that. Lastly, the fourth um, category was to invest in the water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. Water and sewer is pretty, um, you know, self-explanatory. The broadband's a little bit more defined. Um, basically, you have to, the, the scope of the project would have to be to reliably deliver minimum speeds of 100 megabits per second download and 100 megabits per second upload. Um, and it has to be targeted in an unserved or underserved community, um, household and business. Um, and that definition is basically that people are not able to access speeds that delivers 25 megabits per second download and three megabits per second upload speed. So if, if our entire community has that ability, and I don't know if they do, we would be limited in what we could do for the broadband under this definition. However, if we do have areas that are, um, that are lacking, we can build, a, it, it can benefit anybody along the route, it just has to be served to help um, those individuals get that type of service. So a couple weeks ago, I, can, I think it was about 10 days ago, um, Wayne County called a meeting um, to talk about Wayne County's um, needs and was looking for some community input on what the communities would like to spend money on. And they were looking for it to go to their commission. They, they had this meeting at 2.30 on a Friday, I think, 2.30 to 3.30 on a Friday. And they said, we need all of your ideas by next Friday submitted. Um, 
we had no meeting, we had no <laughs> preparation. So um, supervisor and uh, myself called the three full-time electeds together and the directors together and said, we need some ideas quickly to submit to um, the, this is really small, isn't it? I'll read them off to you, but we needed some ideas really quick to submit to the county for some ideas for them. Since this is really small, I'll, I'll read these to you. I'm sorry, I didn't know it'd come across that small. Um, we added Canton Center Road. You know, that's a county and township project. So we, we submitted for a, that road for $7 million. We submitted $2 million for the sidewalk gap programs. Um, drain inf drainage infrastructure, we put in $10 million. Um, you know, we've talked about for a couple years now, the Salts Ridge and Denton um, intersection being really dangerous. The county already has plans for a roundabout, but they said they had no funding. So now we said, you have funding. So we suggested they use some of this for that. Um, you know, on a, you know, wish, we said, what if we were to do a drive up window to have a touchless, you know, if people wanted to pay the treasurer's office, we don't think we'd have enough plans to try to get that done. But could, if we could get the design, you know, why not ask for it? Uh, fire station number four, we know that um, that's gonna serve the southern part of the community, which is a lower income area. So that can, you know, these funds could be utilized for that. Um, an IT disaster recovery plan we put in for a million dollars. Um, the treasurer's office requested a metal door for their vaults. Uh, the parking lot out back uh, needs to be um, repaved and added security to that. We know that project is coming in at $1.7 million, so we asked for that. Uh, an encrypted email solution, which can um, benefit the whole township, but really help the um, police department working with the courts to um, get information back and forth. Uh, we submitted for the social worker, a barrier project for the, for the windows on the treasurer's office windows and um, public customer facing windows. We asked for that. Uh, Nankin transportation. We said, what could we help? What more could we get from Nankin to help our users of that transportation system? And they said, um, besides a, I, I think they're, besides a bus washing system, they said to get some people costs to get more drivers. If they get more drivers, they could help more people. So we put in for $360,000 for that. A pocket park for fire station two and then a high demand mail processing unit, which can help with the elections and get some of the ballots out more quickly. And Wayne County has 339 million to distribute amongst the 43 counties. Correct. Communities, communities, right, sorry. Correct. And you know, we have no indication from the county. I think they said they're gonna meet with their commission in September. Um, so we'll hear word back from them. My, my guess is they already have an idea of what they wanna spend their money on, but hopefully if you know, these overlap, maybe that'll help. Uh, give support to the commission to to enforce those. And we already have a good list started, I guess, once we hear word from them on what the what our township board, what you all would like to see potentially the money spent on as well, it, once we know um, what the county has or has not accepted. So really the next steps, um, our first quarterly report is due on um, August 31st. Uh, we, what we must do is report our lost revenue for 2020. Um, so again, we're still waiting on that one piece of information, but we'll get that report in um, by the end of the month. Um, we would also have to report if we spent any of these dollars um, through July 31st, which we have not. So we just are reporting our lost revenue. We need to wait for the final guidance to be released, at least some question, answers to some of the questions, the big questions. Um, the plan is to have a follow-up study session with the board to talk about what the final, you know, hearing from the board and getting an input on what the township priorities are from the board's perspective to try to start to develop a plan and finalize a plan for this. We need to calculate the 2021 lost revenue in early 22. Um, and then again, we'll have a follow-up study session after that with the board after that 2021 lost revenue has been determined just to kind of finalize where we think uh, we're gonna go. It's important to know that we have till 2024 to obligate these funds, and then 2026 to spend them. So we have, um, you know, five years to, to spend this money. Um, really the guidance I've sat in on, I've probably sat in on seven webinars so far. And one of the things, the recurring themes is don't obligate the money quite yet. The final guidance has not been issued. So think about what you wanna do. 
Um, if you look at anything from the, the CARES Act, the final guidance was constantly changing in what you could and couldn't spend the money on. So um, the recommendations are really to hold off a little bit longer to get some of this final guidance and see, see where um, the Treasury ends up with, with the final, final guidance on, on this. So we have, we have some time, um, but we also want to start to have somewhat of a plan so we know <laughs> what we want to do. So uh, I, we haven't, uh, Supervisor and I haven't talked about the timing of the next study session yet to, to sit down with the board, but we certainly can, can talk about that to figure out what the appropriate timing for that would be. I would have expected the, the Treasury to release some updated guidance. Um, they updated their frequently asked questions on July 19th, which is three days after the questions were due, but they haven't issued anything since that date yet. So I, I would expect something within the next few weeks. I mean, I would, I would hope they would issue something. Uh, you haven't heard anything further? Yeah. So we have not heard anything further on that. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Are there any questions, public questions? Okay, on the board. Stephen? Thanks, Director Trumbull. Um, so is the dollar amount set? The $9.2 million is definitely set. That's set. Correct. So we know that. Okay. We know we, yeah, we know we will receive All that. All right. And um, yeah, I mean, a lot of things up in the air. So thanks for letting us know. Interesting that... Um, what, not water, but sewer. Um, and, uh, but uh, uh, the question I had was on the um, broadband. Um, I'm not sure where I would prioritize it, and I'm not sure if there's going to be any money available even after you calculate our losses for uh, 2021. But I'd be interested to know if that money could be. Um, work, we could use that money to work with the broadband providers and maybe they would leverage it, match it or, or something like that where they, we could, it, and again, like you said, I don't know if we have any gaps in our community for broadband, but if we did, if, if they could um, leverage in our dollars, that might be interesting to talk to them about. I so to answer your question, we definitely would need to work with the with the providers yeah. because if they're not going to give the ser bring the service to the residents, then yeah. you know then it, we're installing it without you know an end user. But I think the um, the providers of the service absolutely would hope to partner with us if we have this pot of money and can help yeah. build the infrastructure. You know, build the infrastructure, and they will come. Right. So I would I would definitely think that. If we have an area that's underserved, they would jump at the opportunity if we contacted some of them to say, yeah. work with us, you know, to put an RFP. We're looking to expand the broadband, mm -hmm. you know, under this last mile or whatever the case might be, asking the providers to, you know, respond to it to see if they would provide the services. Or because provide. we as a government have never funded that, have we? No. no. Okay. So if there's the opportunity for them to do it and have some governmental money to um, accelerate it, then maybe they'd be willing to work with us that way. Correct. Right. And, and if you read the read it, what what the goal is with the broadband is there was a definite um, need that was identified through the pandemic that there were certain communities and certain areas where children and families didn't have access to the broadband to be able to work from home. Um, you know, we could probably work with a school district to find out if there was areas, True. you know, yep. in our, you know, in our community that they could say, yeah, this area could not access it. You know, that might be, you know, a way to find out yeah. if there was a general area or was it a general, you know, household that couldn't afford it or was it a whole community, you know, that didn't have access to it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, SEMCOG has a good map also that shows you can zoom oh, in great. on Canton and you can see that they have different colors for the different strengths all over Canton. But they're also, uh, we, we told them we were interested in this because of Ford Road also. What kind of um, broadband can we put in there while we have everything torn oh, up? Yeah. And so there's, they're having a meeting with us. I can invite you to it if you want to. Who, who's having a meeting? With MDOT. MDOT, MDOT. sent us, yeah, oh, we asked okay. them to and they sent us a meeting notice. Yeah. I'm sure in the technology committee be involved in that at all? Uh, sure, yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. You invite them. Thank. Anyone else? I had a quick question, Wendy. Thank you for the presentation. Um, so you talked about mental health uh, services. Is this for um, the entire community or is this for 
the employees? Uh, how was the directive for that, that the money could be spent on, you know, behavior, behavioral health issues? And you said something about mental health. We can spend the money on that. So is it just the employees of the government or is it the whole township? It could, it could be individuals of the township that would have the need for behavioral health care. There's, there was, uh, I'd have to verify the language. So shake your head, uh, Mike, if I'm gonna misspeak, but I'm, I'm pretty sure the language is, there's an automatic presumption that if somebody needed um, some assistance from the healthcare perspective, it is assumed to have been related to COVID at this, at this point in time because of the pandemic. So whether somebody had a pre-existing condition or not, at this point in time, you know, if the board wanted to say we were gonna fund, I don't know, we wanted to give some of this money to Growth Works to help pay for some of the services for the mental health for people who needs it that during this point I, in time. Yeah, that is what I was that. thinking, partnering with Growth Works. Or, okay. Thank you. Welcome. You're right, uh, partnering definitely makes the money go further also. Okay. Summer, did you have something? Um, no, just a comment. Thank you very much for digging into this. I know it's a lot. I can't wait till we get a little bit more clarity so we can figure out how we're going to invest this money um, in the community. I think the list that you and the directors and the full-time electeds pulled together showed there are different, def definitely great ideas out there. And I know that there are some things that are in our strategic plan um, that could that may fit into some of these categories as well. So looking for looking forward to a study session and digging into it a little bit more. But yeah, I think I would like to read those FAQs. So could you please send them? I, I absolutely <laughs> will email those along. So um, I'm basically just um, dittoing summer here that I um, would like to, to delve in a little deeper with the FAQs and also um, appreciate the work that was put into this and also the work that the full-time electeds and, and you, everyone else, um, all the directors put into to this because I think that um, some of the things that are on the list are really important and, and as Summer said, do fit into our strategic, strategic goals. So. Stephen? I, I did have one more question, which was um, you mentioned um, support for small businesses. And through, was it PPP, um, there, there was great support. Um, I thought, I know some of the nonprofits I've worked with were able to take advantage of that to stay afloat. Do, have you guys heard, have businesses been calling to say that they weren't able to get PPP money and need, wanted to know if they could get some support through the township through this? They have not contacted the finance department. Okay. Yeah, some of them spoke to me about it and um, asking about some of these funds. And one of the things that's interesting that Wendy talked about is how can we target? So let's say we do do something. So can we say, okay, you have to use it to give raises, wage, wages you know, to your employees or maybe target outdoor dining. You can use it to create outdoor dining or something like that or something. So, and you can also utilize the funds because I know one thing with grants is, as you know, Stephen, also you have to administer them, right? So you have to do all the paperwork, back, report yeah. back to the government. It, you could also utilize the funds to use a company to do that for you. The county actually did that for some of their grants. Oh, okay. So there's a lot of things that we're trying to find yeah, out. Yeah, I, I think that if, if we go down the route, if the board wants to go down the route of offering you know, grants to the small businesses, we, are, we will need to look into having a... Um, getting some assistance from a company to help oversee those grants. We don't have enough of the staff power to um, ensure that the program's meeting the um, requirements of the grant, that they have to make sure that they're, they're following the grant rules. So, so we would need to hire a company to help with that, but you can utilize the grant dollars um, from the ARPA grant to help fund, to help fund that. Thanks. Um. Uh, I have a, just a quick um, comment, uh, and Mary, if we can get an update on when we hear back from the from Wayne County on what projects they want to help us with. Definitely, they really stressed partnerships. That's what they wanted to see. So, but as you can see, a lot of our list, the list there was partnerships with Wayne County. You know, the, the roads. A and big we one. did um, put on here that um, we would be willing to fund 25% just to show as a partnership on any of these programs. Yes, because we're already covering the Wayne County part. Also, one of them, like the fire station, our fire station down in that area does will be servicing probably Wayne and Westland, you know, so because we go on, we do do that mutual exchange. 
Summer? Um, this um, conversation just reminded me about the CARES Act funding um, that we got early, I guess it was earlier this year, last year. Um, can you um, send around an update on that funding to show if it's all spent or um, how it's going with Wayne Metro? Oh, yeah, the CDBG CARES yep, Act. That's yes. yep. Yeah, sure, we sure can. Um, well, one, I was just, I was glad that Wayne County, um, brought us to the table to participate in this. Definitely wish we had a little bit more time. That deadline was pretty aggressive. Mm -hmm. Um, we did come together with some pretty awesome projects. I was glad to see the, um, high demand mail processing unit for the clerk's office added to that list. I had initially hoped that I could get a mutual aid or an intergovernmental agreement between multiple communities for using that unit because it would benefit a number of communities um, for the purposes of mailing out ballots. And it would turn what usually is about a four day process into a six hour process. And the overtime in the clerk's office could then be, a, a, could be, could be sent to, towards different tasks um, as opposed to manually stuffing 30,000 ballots. Um, but um, we moved forward and put it on the list here for the county, um, knowing that we would, we would be willing to pay 25% um, if they were willing to pay 75%. And um, that idea, I, and I initially pitched the idea to the county clerk who uh, took that to the Secretary of State, and they're very interested in that as a long-term model for communities to enter into, inter, potentially into interlocal agreements to kind of run the processing of mail ballots um, to make it like more cost-effective for smaller jurisdictions and to kind of save on our time as elections change. So that was super cool. Um, with regards to the overall plan itself, I think, um, I think the, the strategy of trying to absorb as much money uh, as, as possible through lost revenue so that we have more, 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 um, more autonomy in determining how we spend it on legitimate uses inside uh, Canton Township in, in general is a, is a, is a, that's an awesome strategy. Um, I think it's, yeah, I mean, there's always strings attached to all money and if we can kind of take it through the lost revenue angle, it, you just, it frees up. It just frees it up and we don't have to worry about meeting the very strict requirements of the act itself. We can really have a discussion internally about where we truly want to spend that money. So I like that because it empowers the, the residents and the board and the administration to, to lead the way in where that money gets spent as opposed to the federal government. I think it's, you know, for me, I like local is more local, the better. Um, in general. Any other questions or comments? Thanks for the presentation. Thank you. Okay, our first item after this is the consent calendar. Can I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? Um, Madam Supervisor, I move that the board approve the consent calendar uh, as presented. Item C1, request for resolution of local body of government to recognize EDF Parent Boosters as uh, a nonprofit in the community for purposes of making an application for a charitable gaming license to the Bureau of State Lottery. Item C2, consider authorization of permit for 2021 Township Fireworks Display. Item C3, consider approving payment of the 2021-2022 licensing and support renewal for the priority dispatch system. Item C4, consider approving the annual license renewal of Power DMS. And finally, item C5, consider the purchase of a one-year extended warranty for 800 megahertz radios. Support. Thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Okay, motion passes.
Okay, the next item is the general calendar. Item G1, consider approval of site plan for automobile wash establishment, quick pass car wash for Canton crossings. Madam Supervisor, I move that the board adopt the following resolution as presented. The approval of site plan for Canton Crossings Automobile Wash Establishment. Whereas the project sponsor has requested site plan approval for an automobile wash establishment on the north side of Michigan Avenue between Canton Center Road and Old Canton Center Road. And whereas the Planning Commission reviewed the site plan for Canton Crossing Car Wash and voted 7-1 to recommend approval of the site plan with conditions as the site plan is consistent with the approved special land use plan and meets the requirements of the zoning ordinance. Now, therefore, be it resolved. Board of Trustees of the Charter Township of Canton, Michigan is hereby approved the site plan for an automobile wash establishment on the tax parcel, sub, subject pass, tax parcel as proposed in the plan documents subject to the conditions re recommended by the Planning Commission and all applicable state, county, and township requirements. The board. Thank you. The project sponsor proposes to construct a car wash on the east side of the vacant portion of the subject parcel. The site is located between Canton Center Road and Old Canton Center Road, just north of Michigan Avenue which is north of 7-Eleven and Comerica Bank. The site is zoned C3 Regional Commercial and Automobile Wash Establishments are special land uses in the C3 Zoning District subject to Section 6.02D of the Zoning Ordinance. The Township Board of Trustees previously approved the special land use for the car wash on March 23, 2021. Although the plan shows multiple commercial buildings on the site, the site plan application is for the car wash use only. Therefore, the other buildings shown on the plan are illustrative only and will be considered on a future site plan review application. At its meeting on July 12, 2021, the Planning Commission recommended approval of the site plan for the proposed car wash subject to conditions. Do you wanna add anything, Patrick? Uh, I have nothing else to uh, add to our report and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Summer, did you wanna add anything? Um, no. Um... This came before um, the board before, I think earlier this year, um, and I have nothing to add. Right, any I should say this project came before the board, right? <laughs> okay, thank you. Any comments or questions? No? no. Stephen? Thank you. Um, so when reading the uh, minutes from the Planning Commission, there was lots of talk about one-way signs, and I was wondering if anything had been changed or done after that discussion to the plan? Uh, yes, there has been. And what I can do is I can share my screen here and I'll bring up on one of the plan sheets just to, just to illustrate and I'll zoom into an area. The area that we were talking about was off of old Canton Center Road. So on this plan sheet, uh, north is actually left. Uh, so Old Canton Center Road here is at the top of the plan sheet. And when the future, if the, and when the future phases are built out farther on the west side of the site, traffic that enters from Old Canton Center Road will have to turn right going into the site. Otherwise, if they go left, they'll be going the wrong way down uh, a one-way aisle. And so the Planning Commission had discussion in terms of what some of the best ways are to encourage incoming traffic to go right, as well as outbound traffic that's on the north side of the site uh, to make a left to go on to Old Canton Center Road instead of going southward the wrong way down the one-way aisle. Usually with the way the parking spaces are striped, that's an indication of where traffic flow goes, but we worked with the applicant and the planning commission on strategies to improve the one-way access and to indicate which way that drivers need to turn. So on this plan, this is just the signage plan. There's a series of signage in addition to the fire lane signs which are required. There's also a series of one-way signs and do not enter signs to let drivers know at various points where they need to turn and where they can't turn. Um, the Planning Commission was satisfied um, with the signage overall, uh, but wanted to work with staff on any additional strategies to improve that. Since the Planning Commission meeting, what we've uh, done is um, the, the applicant has changed the plans to add some pavement markings, which I'll zoom in on the entrance. 
And so it's a little bit better indication and it will be made part of the site plan. So if they ever stripe the lot or anything like that, they'll have to have these arrows that will direct inbound traffic and outbound traffic where and how they can use that drive. So those are the most um, significant changes since the Planning Commission meeting is to improve the signage on the site to direct traffic. Okay, thank you. The other thing I, I noticed was um, a question of the arch on either end of the um, on either end of the building um, that they be consistent. And I think I saw that that was changed, but I want I wasn't sure exactly what I was reading about it. So, um, if you can just confirm that that was also changed, yeah, on this. Uh, yes. And uh, as we see on the sheet here, there's the north elevation and the south elevation with the arches. So originally one of them was not an arch. Is that what was discussed? Correct. I think they had left that out uh, inadvertently. And so if I go out here a little bit, there's the east elevation at the top that does show the arches at each end. Okay. All right. I thought that looked like it was done. I just wanted to confirm that. Otherwise, it looks good. Any other questions or comments? So no thoughts on having those, what they talked about, pork chops in there? <laughs> is, is that like a, a, a divider that you put when you're entering, like, and some of the, what exactly is that? Uh, it is a uh, raised uh, triangular piece of concrete. Uh -huh. And um, I can zoom into the area and sometimes we'll see them coming in and out of sites where um, it will be a triangular piece that is just outside the sidewalk within the road right of way. And it's to physically move traffic uh, to go um, to turn right in and to turn right out only. Um, one, of the, one of the problems with the pork chops is that a lot of times vehicles will drive over them anyway if they're not uh, signed appropriately and it's just a large raised chunk of concrete. and. Uh, the snow plows hit it, large trucks will drive over it because they can't meet the radius requirements and um, they don't always function as intended. Uh, so we had some discussion about that, but it's uh, not really something we pursued at this location. Okay, so you think the, the signs on the pavement and the do not enter signs should be enough for guiding the traffic? We believe so with um, similar sites that have one-way configurations between the signage and the physical orientation of the curb, we think it will direct traffic appropriately. Um, I'm, I forgot I had one other question, which was, um, does this project complete sidewalks all around this property? Uh, it does. Um, I will uh, zoom out here. Currently there is sidewalk along uh, Canton Center Road so along the east side of Canton Center Road, there is existing sidewalk, uh, which is the west side of this site. Uh, additionally, along Old Canton Center Road, there is sidewalk just south of the side uh, of the site where there's, it terminates and there's a gap. And so the site plan proposes to connect that sidewalk uh, starting on the south side of the site, which is the top right of the screen and it will carry the sidewalk all the way north to the intersection of Canton Center Road and Old Canton Center Road and will fill that gap along the entire east frontage of this lot. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right, great. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion passes. Item G2. Consider final approval of the Monarch Grove Plan Development District. Madam Supervisor, I move that the board approve the following resolution, the approval of the final plan development district for Monarch Grove. Whereas project sponsor has requested final approval of a plan development district for Monarch Grove located at the southwest corner of Ford Road and Gorman Road, which is located between Beck Road and Canton Center Road, and whereas projects, the planning commission reviewed the final plan development plan and plan development agreement and voted seven to zero to recommend approval of the request as it meets the criteria for plan development and results in a definite benefits 
to the community. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Board of Trustees of the Charter Township of Kent, Michigan, does hereby approve the Monarch Grove Final Plan Development District on the subject tax parcels listed as proposed in the Planned Development Agreement and Plan Documents, subject to the requirements of Wayne County and MDOT be, being satisfied that the PD Agreement, or Planned Development Agreement, addresses how the definite benefits will be comp completed to the satisfaction of the Township Attorney and Township Engineer, and that the building architecture meet the requirements of the Zoning Ordinance for 50% masonry. Or Thank you. The applicant proposes a planned development district to construct a housing for the elderly use at the southwest corner of Ford Road and Gorman Road, located between Beck Road and Canton Center Road. The proposed housing for the elderly use consists of 225 units on 17.25 acres, which are proposed as follows. 53 units of independent living, 102 units of assisted living, 60 in phase one and 42 in phase two, 32 units of memory care and 38 attached elderly cottages. Each plan development district is required to demonstrate the definite benefits to the community. While several benefits are noted in the application materials, the following definite benefits are the most consistent with section 27.04 of the zoning ordinance. Architectural design of the buildings, paving of Gorman Road to the site's entrance, including reconstruction of the approach to three lanes with dedicated right and left turn lanes from Gorman Road onto Ford Road, extending the sidewalk along the south side of Ford Road eastward about 620 feet to connect to the existing sidewalk in front of Bell Tire, adding northbound and southbound right turn lanes at the intersection of Canton Center Road and Ford Road to permit overlap phases for northbound and southbound right turns, maintaining over 25% of the site as open space and including outdoor recreation areas for residents of the development that will include pickleball and bocce. Preliminary approval of the planned development was granted by the Township Board of Trustees on January 12th, 2021. Would you like to comment any more, Patrick? Um, I have no additional comments. We have a, a pretty comprehensive report, so I'll be happy to take any questions. Summer, anything from, from you? Um, I'll just say when the Planning Commission um, discussed this project, we talked a lot about the 50% requirement um, for brick, and we decided that we needed to be consistent and follow um, our ordinance and um, go with the 50% brick. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Kate? Yes, yeah, so um, I talked to Patrick about this earlier, but um, I was wondering about um, on, let's see, it's, I think it's page 72 of our packet um, in the um, Planning Commission minutes. It talks about um, how the developer has paid $300,000 into the state's wetland mitigation fund to offset filling in some of the wetlands on the site. And so what I was wondering about, um, and Patrick did answer my question, but I thought some others might wanna understand this also, but the wetlands that are, um, that will be mitigated or saved slash improved with that pay payment, um, will they be in Canton? Uh, yeah, th and that's a good question. And I, uh, I don't believe they're in Canton uh, necessarily. I think they're in um, a nearby uh, watershed. And uh, I had noted, uh, no noted that concerning question to the applicant, uh, Mr. David Endress, who is an attendee in the audience. And, um, if we want to promote him to uh, to either speak, he could address that question in more detail in terms of their process of going through the Eagle uh, wetland mitigation process and what the requirements were. In the webinar. Yes, this is David Endress with Kirko Development. I hope I'm coming through clearly. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, what's what's involved with this um, Eagle, uh, the Michigan Department of Environmental, Great Lakes and Energy, um, with the state of Michigan, has a um, program called Part Three O Three of their Wetland Protection Program, which 
provides a guideline for um, wetlands mitigation credits and how they're created. And, and there's several rules associated with that. This particular project um, in Canton falls into what's called the Maumee Lake Plain Echo Region. And what that really means is um, the state working in concert with actually the EPA defines certain regions where wetlands credits, mitigation credits can be purchased. And we've gone through a process with both EPA, Federal Fish and Wildlife and Eagle. Uh, Eagle has been out to the site, inspected the Canton wetlands, and really determined it to be a very low quality. Um, what this program allows us to do is replicate that area somewhere else within this echo region. Um, and the result of that is really a higher quality wetlands uh, of the exact same area that is recreated elsewhere within that same echo region. So we have engaged in, we will be engaging if this project should be approved uh, with a wetlands banker that is registered with Eagle to purchase the mitigation credits. Um, the wetlands that is being created is uh, already built, inspected, and approved by the state. These, these wetland bankers sort of almost build these on spec. And we would essentially be, be purchasing credits within that program. So I, I, I understand. Um, I just, I guess I'm still concerned because I feel like loss of wetlands in Canton is, uh, you know, that they should be replaced here in Canton if possible. Um, and so I, that's just a concern for me. Um, I understand that everything was done properly and I appreciate that. So. so Patrick, is that a possibility to put in a request like that? Do you know? Um, for this project, I'm not sure, uh, but long term, that is something that we could talk to the engineering division about and maybe talk to Eagle about to see how some of these wetland mitigation areas could potentially be qualified in Canton. Well, you're, I'm sorry. I imagine it might be difficult for a township to permit some type of local wetland uh, requirement, but are you familiar with any cities that might have a permitting process for local wetland? Um, I understand the Eagle process is state law and that's bigger than us. We have no power or say in any of that. But yeah, are you familiar with cities uh, that might have any type of wetland uh, permitting? I know I imagine so you would probably do it through soil erosion or something along those lines or? Um. Yeah, many communities across Michigan, both, Mich both cities and townships have wetland ordinances. In some cases where there are smaller wetlands or minor, relatively minor wetlands that the state does not regulate. Um, some local communities have adopted wetland ordinances to regulate wetlands that are not regulated by the state. So in cases like that, if there's a wetland regulated by the state, they would go to Eagle for permitting. But if there's a, a smaller wetland or a wetland that is otherwise not regulated by the state, some communities have adopted ordinances to regulate the wetlands, which um, can, can address uh, mitigation, can address a process, an application process by which they would have to go through locally to impact a wetland that's not regulated by the state. That would fall within either the zoning powers of the township or a different type of ordinance? Correct. For uh, local communities that do wetland ordinances, um, they would put them either in their zoning ordinance or as a separate ordinance in their code of ordinances. Similar to like our, our tree replacement ordinance, right? That's correct. Currently under judicial review as we speak. Uh, yes, but uh, wetland ordinances, as long as um, they occupy the area that's not covered by state law, um, right. they've been 
they've been enforced throughout the state. That could be a potential project for the next uh, round of interns. <laughs> <laughs> All our wetlands. Hmm? I agree. Steven? Um, thank you. Well, um, just a couple questions. One comment, which I'm sure you're probably, none of you are surprised at, but I am so happy that we're getting 600 um, feet of sidewalk connecting us to the Bell Tire um, complex. And, um, and I remember it was something we talked about at the last meeting on this. Um, so uh, I'm assuming that's contiguous, right? Is, yeah. that's, that's correct. It will go from uh, Gorman Road east uh, to where the sidewalk terminates in front of the Bell Tire. So we are now going to be 600 feet less than 50 miles of sidewalk gap. So that's great. Um, the other questions that I had, oh, also the other comment was, in reading this, I was happy to see that um, um, Mr. Endress and, and this organization has um, taken lessons from the pandemic and actually implemented um, some higher ceilings and a um, ventilation system that pro would um, be helpful in future situations like that. So I, I was pretty impressed in that. Um, and then the other thing is, um, and Patrick, in looking at this, it looks like we're accepting a, quite a number of variances. Um, and it looked like there's six outlined here. Is that, do you have any concerns with the number of variances that um, we're accepting in this project? Um. Going uh, going one by one, um, it it doesn't uh, it doesn't arise as a major concern. Um, the first is the building length, where um, there's a length of 464 feet uh, along the main building, and there's a maximum of 350 feet allowed. Um, one of the one of the uh, architectural items that mitigates that is that there are a lot of angles in the building, so it's not one solid line of wall that's okay. that's a long, um, almost institutional-looking building. So there's enough. Uh, relief and projection in the architecture where it doesn't appear like uh, a much longer building. So in terms of the maximum building length, um, that's not a major concern. Plus with um, multi-use facilities for housing for the elderly, it would include um, independent living, dependent living, and elder care. And sometimes the length of the building is more necessary because you want to get from one end to the other without having to go outside to go to a, a different building. So sometimes a longer building is, is okay. Um, the next one is the second uh, modification is the building height where they're proposing uh, 42 and a half feet where 35 feet is allowed. So there's a, a modification of uh, seven and a half feet and as uh, you had noted, they have higher ceilings and they have more duct work for ventilation. And uh, the planning commission was satisfied with the building height given um, how far from the lot lines that height would be so that it wouldn't be that imposing um, on the neighbors. And it's still held at the maximum number of stories of three. Um, the third request for relief was the masonry percentage and the planning commission did not recommend approval of that modification. The planning commission recommended that it be 50% masonry um, the next request was um, for wetland setbacks to be less than 25 feet proposed from any wetland that will remain. Um, these are modifications that we typically support because the applicant will get a permit from the state to fill certain wetlands, which is uh, at the jurisdiction of the state. But if there are wetlands remaining, oftentimes we've granted modifications to lower the setbacks. Otherwise, to achieve a 25 foot setback, it would encourage them filling in even more wetland or there would just be a non-wetland setback. So in cases like this where wetlands are filled in, uh, we frequently support uh, a narrower setback to that existing wetland or remaining wetland as a way to encourage uh, preserving as many wetlands as possible. The, um, the, the fifth and sixth modifications are the minimum side to rear and side to side building spacing. And those reduced setbacks impact only the internal buildings on the site. So we're not reducing the impacts on neighbors that live next door. It's between the proposed buildings within the site itself. And sometimes having closer buildings um, within a unified development is, is not impactful and actually helpful in order to get from one place to the other without 
expanding that travel distance. Okay, you don't feel it's gonna look too crowded, all the different style of buildings? Because uh, it was pretty significant, if I remember, the reduction uh, in side and front to back setbacks. Um, yeah, for the side to rear, um, for uh, a handful of the cottage units, it's proposed to be um, 24.2 feet, um, which is less than the 60 feet required, but the 60 feet is uh, almost like a multifamily standard. And these cottages, um, a lot of them are one story. They have high ceilings and high roof pitches, but oh, okay. um, with being, um, they basically have a, a look of single family um, residential or single family attached. And in some of our single family attached uh, districts and our products, the spacing distance is even narrower than that. Really? Okay. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I just wanted to talk about the wetland setbacks for a moment. <laughs> um, so I, I understand, and I, I thank you for explaining about um, why that's sometimes um, may, you know, why the modifications sometimes made, but we could still require that, right? We could still require the 25 foot setback. Uh, that's correct. The 25 foot setback could be required um, from a wetland and um, the, the applicant would either, um, they would either have to adjust the location of the building to be 25 feet uh, from the wetland or um, in, in depending on the type of wetland and the orientation of the layout, um, they may change their eagle permit to fill in more wetland to be the 25 feet. Um, I've seen that happen before where somebody wants to avoid going to the Zoning Board of Appeals for a variance, so they amend their eagle permit just to, just to be that 25 feet. Okay, can you, can you explain why we have um, a 25 foot setback minimum? Yeah, the uh, 25 foot setback is to allow a buffer between um, a building or a structure to a wetland. So if there's runoff, if there's uh, foot traffic, if there's any other activity that may impact a wetland, that 25 feet just allows for a buffer. And within that 25 feet, uh, somebody can have a lawn, um, they can have uh, a garden, they can, they can plant uh, trees and shrubs and, and things like that but they can't build structures, they can't have their house, they can't have decks. And uh, in some cases, they may not even be able to grade within 25 feet of a wetland because grading can also be impactful, both in the short term, the grading itself, and the long term by changing the pitch and elevation near the wetland. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I'd like to call a vote on the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. So we have five ayes and one nay. Okay, thank you. Item G3. Consider approval for a purchase order for additional costs for the emergency <coughs> underground line service repair at Heritage Park in May. Madam Supervisor, I move to approve a purchase order to Utilities Instrumentation Services at 2290 Bishop Circle East, Dexter, Michigan, 48130 in the amount of $2,562.70 for the additional cost of repair of underground service lines at Heritage Park to be paid from the Community Improvement Fund listed. Support. On Friday, May 7, 2021, Facility Services was notified that the park's golf maintenance building was experiencing issues with their power. Upon investigation, Facility Services staff determined that two of the three legs were reading at 75% and noticed that the COVID testing site was also experiencing power losses issues. Corby, Corby Energy Services Incorporated, a preferred contractor who was on site for the emergency generator or final inspection at Fire 1, was contacted immediately to investigate where they confirmed that the power was being interrupted. Corby supplied generators to temporarily get the power back running and then called Utilities Instrumentation Service to determine the cause of the issue. On May 26, 2021, Corby Energy and UIS each submitted an invoice for their services totaling $22,577.42, which was approved by the board on June 8, 2021, agenda item G5. Due to the urgency of this matter, 
The memo was sent to the supervisor and finance director requesting to waive the bidding process for the emergency repair. Upon their approval, the purchase orders were submitted. The emergency repairs were made. However, the repair costs came in over the initial estimate by $2,562.70, refuses that were necessary and that had not been billed by UIS at the time of their initial invoicing. Let's see. I don't know. Um, actually, you wouldn't know about this one, right? This would be more under John. John, so Liz, anything you want to add? Okay. Okay. All right. The, any questions from the board or comments? Okay. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Motion passes. Item G4. Consider approval of 2021 budget adjustments. Madam Supervisor, I move to approve the attached listing of budget adjustments to the 2021 budget. Board. Thank you. The Township adopted the 2021 budget at the November 10, 2020 board meeting, and various adjustments have been made to it since then. At this time, I'm asking the Board of Trustees to approve the attached budget items to the 2021 budget year. A description of the budget adjustments is explained on the attachments. Uh, Wendy, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, I Would the board like me to go through the... And a high, a high level by fund, or I'm happy to answer questions. I can go through, or if you're comfortable, I do not have to go through any. Hey, any comments or questions on the attachments? Okay, no, great, thank you. Um, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Motion passes. Item G5. Consider approval for purchase order increase to Harold's LLC for grounds treatment at Pheasant Run Golf Club. Madam Supervisor, I move to approve an increase to the PO number listed in the amount of $9,000 for the grounds treatments at Pheasant Run Golf Club to Harold's LLC at PO Box 935358, Atlanta, Georgia, 31193 to be paid from the account number listed for maintenance and repair grounds. Support. At the January 26, 2021 board meeting, the Board of Trustees approved RBA G7. I'm sorry, I'm reading the background. <laughs> I'll go up to the summary. Pheasant Run Golf Club is recommending to increase purchase order 2021-0000690 to Harold's LLC in the amount of 9,000 to cover additional contingencies for various chemicals and fertilizers at Pheasant Run Golf Club. Uh, Greg, do you have anything to add? Yeah, just that these are um, primarily expenses related to chemicals from the unusual heat that we've had this summer and then the excessive rain that's drawn in uh, just caused some additional need for chemical treatments on the course. And then I'd also draw your attention to the attachment that we provided um, just showing revenue year to date this year. Actually, it's uh, a little bit out of date now. It's through the end of July um, and through the end of July um, we were um, about $460,000 ahead of our eight-year average for this time th um, uh, through the end of July for the previous eight years. So um, the, the course has been seeing significant use this year. Um, last year was similar, um, but we didn't, we're actually well ahead of last year's pace because uh, we were shut down at the beginning of the year. Thank you. Do you think that so the chemicals are also, do you think, because of the increased usage or just the increased rain? Yes, uh, primarily the, the rain and heat, but a little bit because of the usage um, just for patching and repair work for divots and those sorts of things on the course. Thanks. Any questions or comments? Michael? Yeah, why do you think um, golf is so hot right now? Well, it's uh, last year one of the few things that you could do. Um, so that really drove interest in golf, but it's also one of the few things, uh, well, it's just naturally a safe activity. You have social distancing built into that activity and it's just nationwide. Um, it's seen a significant increase and we're hoping to continue to build on that. Our, our uh, manager at uh, Pheasant Run has also done a fantastic job of pursuing additional league play, which kind of insulates us from 
um, potential weather issues because um, that's the, those players are more locked in than your just daily drop in. Um, but if you try and get a tee time on a weekend right now at Pheasant Run, if you call on Thursday, you're probably not going to get one that weekend. Or if you are, it's going to be late in the evening. So schedule ahead of time. Okay, and I don't see any talk about the other golf course, Fellows uh, Creek. Why, why would that be? Um, the, their chemicals are handled through our um, contracting company out there, but they have also seen significant increases in play out there as well. That being absorbed inside the existing contract with a yes. uh, vendor? Yes. Okay. I imagine they're seeing a substantial amount of revenue. Good for them. Well, actually, all the revenue uh, for that course does come in to the uh, township. They just receive a monthly management fee. Okay. Okay. Their, their success um, is our success out there as well. All right. Maybe you can get those numbers, too, to the board. Okay. Thank you. Kate? Um, yes. At some point, um, I'm wondering if, and it's, I don't need it immediately, but wondering if we can get an idea of what kind of chemicals are being put on the golf courses. And also I make a request that um, in the future we look for companies, and I'm not saying this company doesn't do this, I don't know what they do, um, but make, um, make a request that we look for companies in the future that are using more environmentally safe chemicals and fertilizers. We do um, use uh, very strict, there are very, and there are much more stringent guidelines for golf courses, okay. especially around the, the wetlands, um, as to what you can use, um, as opposed to what you would use in your home, potentially. Um, like we don't use any phosphorus products, those sorts of things that um, can have effects on um, Pond life and right. uh, wetlands and those sorts of things. Of so yeah, algae. we don't use right. any phosphorus um, products on either right. of the courses. I'm, I'm more concerned about like pesticides or herbicides. Okay, yeah, we can certainly provide an overview to you um, on the products that we do use. Thank you. I I have the same request. If we can get the details of the products, and we certainly can do that. Anyone else? All right, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Okay, motion passes. Item G6, consider accepting a FEMA assistance to firefighters grant for the purchase of firefighter physicals and cancer screenings and an associated amendment to the 2021 fire budget. Madam Supervisor, I move to approve accepting the FEMA assistance to firefighters grant for the firefighter physicals and cancer screenings and the overall project amount of $142,000 $142,080. I also uh, move to approve the uh, attached fire 2021 fire budget amendment associated with the grant award. Support. Thank you. The fire department is requesting the board of trustees accept a FEMA assistance to firefighters grant, which has been awarded to Canton in the amount of $129,163.64 for use toward firefighter physical exams and cancer screenings for a two year period. This grant requires a 10% match by Canton in the amount of $12,916.36 for a total budget of $142,080. So congratulations on the grant. Um, Chris, do you wanna add anything to that? Uh, I just wanna um, thank the finance too. Um, you know, Mike Shepard works with me on these grants an awful lot. So um, we're very pleased to get this grant. We've been um, looking forward to getting these physicals going for the firefighters for many years and through negotiation with the union as well as, you know, the township here with NHR. Um, it's finally coming to fruition, and I think that it's a, a wonderful thing to provide for the firefighters. Um, so we're looking forward to getting this going and uh, just fortunate enough to get a couple years paid for to get us started. Yeah. Any questions or comments? All right. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Okay. Motion passes. Item G7. Consider approving the purchase of cabinets and furniture for the training room at Fire Station 1. Madam Supervisor, I move to approve the purchase of cabinets and furniture from Kentwood Office Furniture, the township's current contracted furniture vendor, in the amount of 
$12,144.06 utilizing funds budgeted in the 2021 Fire Capital Outlay Building and Improvements account. Support. Thank you. The fire department is requesting to purchase new cabinets and furniture for the training room at Fire Station 1. The department received a quote in the amount of $12,144.06 from Kentwood Office Furniture, the township's current contracted furniture vendor. Chief Stockline, would you like to add anything? Uh, I think the uh, RBA says everything, um, but this is all original stuff from uh, 20 years ago when the station was built, and it's our own training room. So um, we're updating that and had it planned and budgeted um, this in, in the next item as well. Thanks. All of those in favor of the motion? I oh, I'm sorry. If I may. Yes. Um, when was um, the last time we did an RFP for our approved vendor? When, you remember when Kentwood was brought on as the approved vendor? Anybody? I can tell you that they've, uh, they've had this, I believe this is the third year and final year of that. <laughs> okay, so we'll be probably putting out an RFP for that to try to get a fresh number and see who's out there. I would imagine so. Yeah, we did. We actually thought when we we looked at this originally that that was uh, expired. Uh, but when we went back and looked at that, um, we found that it was still um, valid for I believe the rest of this year. Perfect. Other questions or comments? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Motion passes. Item G eight: Consider approving the purchase of audiovisual training equipment for Fire Station One. Madam Supervisor, I move to approve the purchase of audiovisual training equipment from Metro Detroit Integrated Systems in the amount of $15,681.05, utilizing funds budgeted in the 2021 Fire Capital Outlay Computers and Equipment Account. Support. Thank you. The Fire Department is requesting to purchase new video and audio training systems for the training room at Fire Station 1 in the amount of $15,000. $681.05 from Metro Detroit Integrated Systems. The Township's Finance Department solicited bids for this project in July and received no bids. Chief Stockline, you want to add anything or, or Wendy? Nope. Okay. Any questions or comments? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay? Motion passes. Item G9. Consider approving a request for participation in Ferro Technology Certified Training Course. Madam Supervisor, I move to approve the request for two officers to participate in the Ferro Technology Certified Training Course in the amount of $17,336 utilizing the buy one, get one free offer from the 2021 Police Training Account. Support. Thank you. The police department is requesting to send two officers to participate in a Ferro Technologies five-day train the trainer program. The cost for one participant is $17,336 and Ferro is currently offering a buy one get one free offer. The two officers attending would then be certified to train additional department officers upon completion of the course. Um, Chief Chad, do you have anything on this to add? Certainly the uh, Ferro Technologies uh, came to our organization, I believe, about two years ago. It is a 3D scanner. Essentially, we use it for accident reconstruction and crime mapping at scenes of crimes. Uh, we're one of the few agencies that have so many reconstructionists in the uh, southeast Michigan. With this program, we'll be able to, uh, it'll be a force multiplier because when you first look at the uh, price of the uh, training, it's quite considerable. That's what I see when I first look at it, but we'll be able to um, train many officers at, and succession planning because we're going to see we've one of the most talented uh, accident reconstructionists retired in the last two years, and you're going to see that coming in the, uh, in the future as we can train those coming behind will be ahead of the game. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Kate? All right. Um, I'm just wondering where um, does the training take place? Uh, I have to take, uh, take a look at that. I believe it may be in Texas. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All the, okay, go ahead. I'm just excited that we got the BOGO discount. <laughs> Exciting. <laughs> questions or comments? Okay, great. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. 
Motion passes. Item G10, consider sale of Canton property and authorize Supervisor Graham Hudick to sign all documents necessary to close on the sale. Madam Supervisor, I move that Canton accept the letter of intent from Maria Harshi, or Harsh, and authorize the supervisor uh, to sign the formal purchase agreement and any other documents necessary to complete the sale of the parcel located at the southwest corner of Michigan Avenue and Beck Road. Support. Thank you. On July 30th, 2021, Canton's economic development manager received a letter of intent from Maria Harsh, attorney for Corey and Michelle Weaver, offering $6,689.77 for approximately 4.21 acres on the southwest corner of Michigan and Beck Roads as property number listed. The property was purchased by Canton Township from Wayne County in 2008 to obtain right of way should Beck Road be paved. The purchase price was $6,689.77. By law, Canton Township is not allowed to profit from sale of land purchased from tax foreclosure. Corey and Michelle Weaver are the owners of Zippy Auto Wash, which has three other locations in Pittsfield Township, Skyo Township, and the city of Saline. The Weavers are currently under contract to purchase an adjacent property at 47725 Michigan Avenue. It is their desire to acquire both properties simultaneously for the construction and operation of a Zippy Auto Wash on the northern portion of the parcels. The letter of intent has been reviewed by Canton's legal manager and should the board approve the letter of intent, a formal purchase agreement will be drafted then signed by Supervisor Graham Hudak. Any comments or questions? Michael. I have a question, um, and I apologize if I'm looking at the background you just read. We'd initially purchased that property, I believe, if at some point in time Back Road were going to be paved, exiting the south end of the township and going into Van Buren Township. Um, do you know, did we, are we keeping an easement or are we, keep, are we keeping a portion of that property for the same purpose if at some point in time that road is going to be, is going to be paved? I, I, and looking at the road and kind of and, and knowing what's there, I, I, I'm not, I don't expect it will be paved anytime soon, but that's my, that's my, my, my I guess my only real concern with this. Patrick, you worked with Kristen on this. <clears throat> um, with the easement, I'm, I'm not sure if that includes the dedication of the easement or if that easement already exists. I can check with Kristen in the morning. So we don't have, okay, so we don't know? No, we don't know. Well, hang on, the property was, okay. This is the one with the, the building on it right now, that dangerous building that has to be torn down. Right. No, okay, because I had had a conversation with Kristen, our economic development director or manager, about about that, um, keeping, and I, I can just go quiet and read the, and just, just double check the letter of intent to see if it's in there, if somebody else wants to talk. My apologies. Sure, and you can also add that into the motion. Does anyone have any other questions while we're reading? Kate? Go ahead. Go ahead. So um, I am wondering a couple of things. One is do the um, people who want to purchase this property, are they already aware of the other um, auto washes in the area, including the, the one that has yet to be built? Um, they are. We've we've notified them of the existing car wash that's on the south side of Michigan Avenue, east of Canton Center Road, as well as the proposed car wash on the north side of Michigan Avenue uh, between Old Canton Center and Canton Center Road. So we've notified them just to let them know that there are two other car washes nearby, but also when they apply ultimately for the rezoning if they're successful with the purchase agreement, when they apply for a rezoning and a subsequent special land use application, they'll have to address market need at that time. Okay. Okay. Um, and then my other question is, I guess for Anne-Marie, um, possibly, but um, I'm wondering, it says um, in the, I think it's the letter of intent that the seller shall pay the closing costs. 
And I'm wondering if we have an idea of how much those will be. I don't know what those costs are. No, I don't know what they agreed to pay. I guess it would depend on, it's not in the letter of intent at this point, but they will pay the closing costs of the purchase of that land plus. It says that we will pay it. Yeah. Not them. Purchase price, $2,000. I don't know the total cost, no. I do not. It's not in this one. So I know we can't profit from this, but I'm Correct. concerned that we're going to lose money on it if we have to pay a lot of closing costs. And add that. I have to find out from. It's not an estimate, correct? But we can also add in the motion about the easement if you want, Michael. So yeah, I mean, there's. I guess you're right. There's two ways to go about doing that. One would be to table this motion and try to get an answer for that and then address this at a later date. If, I don't know, if, if they're in a hurry, we could approve it and modify the conditions. Right. And I just hope that, that they're comfortable with that. Because uh, if they're not, then, you know, back. we approved an agreement that's not going to be signed. I, so we can I table know it. What you would like to do? I think. Um, Let's table it then. You want to do that? Yep. I don't think there's a date for. Um, they haven't appeared before the planning commission yet. Is that right, Patrick? Uh, they have not. Nor have they filed any application for rezoning. Okay. So I don't see a time constraint. And I would support the idea that we ask the buyer to pay the closing yes. costs or. Or at the very least, split it down. You know, we can yes. split it down the middle. I guess. I think that's a valid concern. Okay, so we will table this. Um, can I have a vote on eyes? Madam Supervisor, I move to table the motion. Support. Okay, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Nays. That okay. We will table the motion. Item G11, consider approval for Deputy Supervisor Employment Contract. Madam Supervisor, I move to approve the employment contract for the Deputy Supervisor. Support. Thank you. The Canton Board of Trustees approved an organizational assessment by Novak Reftalis in February of 2021. Out of that assessment came the recommendation to create and fund a deputy supervisor position to supplement the increased responsibilities of the supervisor's office. The deputy supervisor position was approved at the July 27th board meeting. This RBA is to approve the employment contract for the deputy supervisor position. Any questions? I, we went over this last week um, during our meeting with the details. Any questions? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Motion passes. Item G12, consider approval for creation of ITI department and for IT director position. Oh no, this is not the latest one. Not me. All right, Madam Supervisor. I move to approve the creation of a standalone ITI department upon the hiring of the ITI director. I move to approve the position of ITI director and authorize the starting salary within the estimated based upon the minimum and maximum of grade 13 of the 2021 non-union classified employee salary grade system in the merit policy, including all applicable payroll taxes and estimated for fringe benefits based upon family coverage. The range approved is estimated between 120 and 224,000. 
And I move to approve the attached budget amendment. Report. Thank you. Canton Township has been growing steadily over the last decade and is the ninth largest municipality in Michigan with 98,600 residents. The needs of the community have also continued to grow due to larger, the larger population, which lead to increased governmental services and governing functions and requirements to Canton residents. Due to the requirements to meet community needs and board goals, several positions were recommended to be created by an organizational assessment completed by Novak Reftelis in February of 2021. To meet the organization's evolving technology needs, the township is creating a standalone information technology and innovation department, ITI, led by an experienced ITI director. The increasing reliance of township departments, programs, and residents on integrated technology solutions requires a more coordinated and strategic approach. This is an approach common to many charter townships within Michigan, with Clinton, Macomb, and Waterford townships all having standalone information technology departments to meet their organization's technology needs. This RBA requests approval for a standalone ITI department and an ITI director position. The ITI director's salary and benefits are estimated based on the minimum and maximum of grade 13 of the 2021 non-union classified employee salary grade system in the merit policy, including all applicable payroll taxes and estimates for fringe benefits based upon family coverage. The range approved is estimated between 120 to 120,000, 224,000. Any questions? This is part of also the, what we went over last week, the presentation. Tanya? I just have a comment that we, this is a great step in the right direction. Um, because I, I was surprised when I came in that we didn't have a separate IT department with, while we are handling so much sensitive information for election documents, tax documents, there's always a cybersecurity threat. So I think it is the right step in, in the right direction and especially making it uh, just not IT, but the innovation department where we are planning to work with different technologies like we just talked about the broadband and things like that. So um, I think it would be a great benefit to the community. It will help us make our website better and serve the community better. Thank you. Summer? Yeah, I, I want to agree with um, Trustee Ganguly. I think that this is a great thing for the township. Um, I'm really excited that we will have um, this position and hopefully this, the director of this position can help align the IT needs across the township organization um, to make sure that everything works, works well. Um, just a question for you. Um, how soon would you, are you planning to bring on someone in this position and how will you be um, posting and hiring for this position? So the process requires that we go before the merit committee, which is scheduled for August 30th, next Monday. And we bring this to them and we bring them a job description and the merit board um, asks questions and then they approve it. And then after that, it's posted. So it could be posted as early as next week. Thank you. Michael? Thank you, Madam Supervisor. I think, um, you know, one, I, I had asked um, a couple of days ago that we change the position from information technology uh, to information technology and innovation. And I, well, I would like to think that I'm brilliant. Uh, obviously, that is an idea stolen from other communities um, who have called it information technology and innovation. The most geographically local would be the city of Livonia. Uh, but the initial inspiration was Burlington, Vermont, which when we did our vision uh, setting and our mission setting in way back in February of this year, I picked Burlington as my community, and part of what I liked about it was that they had the ITI position, and I liked adding innovation there because it changed the idea from a specific service-oriented reactionary department to a proactive department, and I would hope to see that. One of the things that um, we would like to see, obviously, is a migration to a .gov website and .gov servers for the township um, and to, to kind of coordinate that with the new township website rollout and a uh, little teaser uh, update to the township logo, right, that township quote rebrand and do it under the .gov, the auspices of a .gov. Um, and the reason why it's important for election purposes and to do it before the next election is um, 
the .gov domain creates a significant amount of credibility um, that you don't get otherwise. Uh, luckily, I did talk to uh, Ferndale City Manager today uh, before I came to the meeting, and they made the transition in 2011. Now, they're a smaller organization. They have about 167 employees, uh, but, but, this, the, the, but the city manager and, um, and their IT director were able to make that transition in-house, and um, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a little bit arduous. There was a cost to it, um, but moving from a commercial license to a government license, um, it can be significant, and it's extremely important as I think you become a... Um, you know, everything in your justification for creating this department. You know, we are no longer the Canton Township of the Jim Poole years or the Canton Township of even the Tom Yak years. Um, we are the Canton Township that is moving into the 21st uh, century. And, um, you know, we've already, we're already two decades into the 21st century. So, so here we go. Thank you, Stephen. Um, yeah, I am all for this. I, um, as you know, in my day job, work with um, directors of IT, um, and they are very specialized in, in um, focusing on technology and for their organizations and the wave of the future, what things are coming down the pike and ensuring security and things like that. But I think we'd be remiss if we haven't thanked Director Trumbull for playing this role for the last decade, essentially. Um, I've always been impressed with her ability to shift from her natural abilities in finance to IT very adeptly at these meetings and give us uh, in the information that we ask for um, without even having gone to your staff in the meeting. You're always prepared and I appreciate uh, the work. I know you'll definitely miss my questions um, when they come along. And um, so if you want to speak up in, in before the uh, director of IT, I, we will allow that. So, but thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? I have a, what, just a uh, quick comment. At yes. some point, we're going to have to talk about the physical layout of this room. No, they're going to move closer together. <laughs> ah, gotcha. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Wait, do you guys want some water? Is it okay? You want some? Okay. Back to the board back. Thanks. Item G13. Consider approval for the creation of a municipal services deputy director. Madam Supervisor, I move to approve the position of municipal services director and authorize the starting salary and benefits to be estimated based upon the minimum and maximum of the grade 11 of the 2021 non-union classified employee salary grade system and the merit policy, including all applicable payroll taxes and estimated for fringe benefits based upon the fa family coverage. The range approved is estimated between 107,000 and 196,000. I further move to approve the following uh, budget amendment based on the estimated provided by no by ref Tellis for the salary and fringe benefits for this position prorated for the remainder of 2021 support thank you Canton Township has been growing steadily over the last decade and is the ninth largest municipality in Michigan with 98,600 um, residents the needs of the community have also continued to grow due to the larger population which leads to increased governmental services and governing functions and requirements to Canton residents Due to the requirements to meet community needs and board goals, several positions were recommended to be created by an organizational assessment completed by Novak Reftelis in February of 2021. The scope of MSD's operations and functions is considerable. With this single department encompassing functions that most local governments would organize into separate departments led by their own directors or superintendents. The creation of a deputy director position for MSD will increase the MSD director's capacity to focus on high-level issues, including developing implementation strategies for the board's strategic objectives and implementing the recommendations included within this assessment. 
This RBA requests approval for an MSD deputy director position with an estimated salary and fringe benefits based upon the minimal and maximum of grade 11 of the 2021 non-union un, union classified employee salary grade system in the merit policy, including all applicable payroll taxes and estimates for fringe benefits based upon family coverage. The range approved is estimated between 107,000 and 196,000. Any comments or questions? No? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Item G14. Consider approving additional services to the phase two contract for the architectural and engineering services for renovations to the public safety headquarters building and associated amendments to the 2021 police and fire budgets. Madam Supervisor, I move to approve the proposal from Partners in Architecture for additional AE services for full replacement of the HVAC system in the Public Safety Headquarters building in the amount of $58,500 and to approve the uh, attached associated amendments to the 2021 police and fire budgets. Support. The police and fire departments are requesting additional services be approved to the Architectural and Engineering Services contract awarded to Partners in Architecture on April 27, 2021. The original contract requested an upgrade to the HVAC controls in the public safety building, but upon further review, the department is now requesting to replace all of the existing HVAC equipment servicing the first and second floors of the building. Partners in Architecture is proposing an AE fixed fee of $58,500 for this additional effort and will invoice based on percentage of completion. So uh, Chief Stockline and Bao, do you have anything to add? So I, I think it kind of speaks for itself. You know, we want to make sure that we continue to use the same architect for the same building. Um, you know, we've had these issues in the past um, and it's also been run by all the other directors. Um, so we're all on the same page and uh, working with Cressa as well um, on this issue. So this is really just the design of the HVAC through that side of the building, ensuring that we have operational equipment um, that is all working on the same plan rather than having a couple of different architects come through and um, trying to mend their, all their projects together. <clears throat> Thanks. You had nothing, anything? I know you guys are working together on this or, <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, between us, uh, Chris is the expert when it comes to this stuff, but it does bring un uniformity for the township. So there's not. <coughs> Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? All, right. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Motion passes. Item G15. It's our last item. Let's see, I have it here. We're going to have to go to another screen. <coughs> yes, there we go. Okay. Oh, thank you. There it was. Um, consider waiving the formal bidding process and approval and approve the installation of temporary fencing around the public safety <coughs> generator and cell tower. Madam Supervisor, I move to approve waiving the formal bidding process and approve the installation of temporary fencing around the public safety generator and cell tower by A.M. Higley in the amount of $18,329.83. Support. Thanks. The police department is requesting to waive the bidding process and install 216 linear feet of eight foot temporary fencing around the emergency generator and cell tower located behind the public safety headquarters. Three informal quotes have been received by the township's facility services division and the recommendation is to go with A.M. Higley in the amount of $18,329.83. Director Bow, do you have anything to add? I do, I do. Uh, in November, this board approved a project approximately $50,000 to achieve the same goal. We're required by a, a standard in CLIA to have security around the tower and generator. Since then, that price point went up to over $70,000. And John, since he's came on board, has found another solution for us, and that's come in at $18,000. So it's a modification of the original cost. We expect in the near future to bring a bigger project project that not only protects the uh, infrastructure of the township, which is our tower and generator, but also the employees, given to some of the issues that have occurred here recently, and some of the no notes that we've uh, worked with the Homeland Security, some of the things that we need to do to improve our uh, security around our police building. I don't know if John has a moment he can uh, speak to, but he, he came tonight to explain some of the, the process that he went through to put this project together for us so quickly. 
Uh, do you want to go to the podium, sir? Thank you. I guess this is one of the first projects that I uh, was roped into uh, my first week, which is uh, a very necessary project as well. Um, I just took a different approach to it, knowing the, the, um, the timetable we were up against and kind of take the out-of-box uh, approach to this and meeting the goals um, for the accreditation and satisfying all our directors and public safety. Um, the temporary fencing with a screen vinyl mesh around it will block and enclose all the HVAC systems and the backup generators. So um, you'll have an eight foot fence, which is a requirement. Um, we'll have a trim up top with an angle on the outside so it deters people from trying to climb along with that vinyl anti-barrier um, as well. We do have three man gates um, so we can access to get into any of the infrastructure through there as well as the tower. So we put the man gates in there and I assume that we would probably collectively put a, a combination lock or just a lock under one key for all of us to access. Um, so this will all be harnessed and supported anchors on the concrete sidewalks. We will not have to do any digging um, to infringe any of the electrical that might be running underneath the ground there. So that was the main focus I think we wanted. We wanted to get it up quick um, and, and serve the purpose as well. Thanks. So you'll be working nights doing this on your own. Then. I, I'm excited to do it, yes. Yeah. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Good, just kidding. Good job. Any comments or questions? I have a, a brief question. I see that A.M. Higley wasn't the lowest bidder. Can, can someone explain to me why Correct. we chose to go with them over industrial fence? Yeah, I can start gate? that off if yeah, you don't mind. Please. Yeah, the main um, focus was that was one, the vinyl scrim was provided by A.M. Higley and industrial fence did not provide that. I guess the most, um, the one that stands out the most is industrial fence was only a six foot high fence versus an eight foot high by Higley as well. Um, and another um, a point that I found reading over is that this includes the removal and labor once we are complete with this enclosure too by A.M. Higley, which is not noted on the other one as well. But just in talking with everybody and going over the project with them, that was another note to add. Hey, John, wasn't there an aesthetic issue with the barbed wire too? Correct. Yeah, yep. that was a, the last point is um, industrial fence proposed putting barbed wire on top of the six foot versus a, a, a line um, tension grid, which doesn't look as, as bad. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments from the board? Nope. Good job. Okay. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. All right, great, motion passes. So you'll meet the deadline now. <laughs> Next item on the agenda, any other items from the directors or managers that you wanna add? No? Um, any other pub public comment? Do we have any public comment online? Any public comment here, public comment? Public comment, no? Anything online? see what appears to be predominantly township employees, a couple individuals who may be from the public, but nobody indicating that they would like to speak for public comment. Okay, great, thanks. All right, I just wanted to do a quick report to the board of something we found out this morning. Remember not too long ago, we gave a $2.50 incentive raise to some of our part-time employees. I just wanted to give you some statistics on that. So 40 days prior to us doing that, um, for our part-time jobs, we had 47 applications, um, and 12 people that were, had worked for us were planning on leaving. 40 days after doing that, we've had 78 applications, and we've recently had three people say they were leaving. So you can see the amount of applications almost doubled, which worked great. Um, so we are right now um, hiring some, and um, Director Gray can say a little bit more about what's happening there but that's really good news. Another study we did, we had some of our HR team look at part-time wages around, and we found that we are pretty much in line with some of the surrounding communities, but we know that that's not our main competition. You know, main competition is basically the stores in Canton, um, lifetime fitness, high velocity, things like that. And we noticed that some of the things that they were doing is they were posting incentives, like um, you know, the signing bonuses or a great place to work. So we decided to add to our, um, some of our postings saying things like that, you get a free 
Summit membership if you work here part-time, and also $25 golfing. So we made sure that those incentives were out there so people could see that also. But this is a really good um, outlook on what, you know, what we did as a board. So that's great. Greg, I don't know if you want to say anything more about some of the applicants we've been seeing. Yeah, we're still working through um, screening those applications and seeing how many of those applications will turn into employees. So they're, we're not there yet, um, but we are in that process. Yep, so that, tur that turned out well. Um, and we, I also read an article recently that, you know, unemployment, they're saying is only 20% of what's happening out there now, they believe. It was a Forbes article basically saying, and also done by the state of Michigan, saying that most of the people they're seeing our unemployment are on the other end of the spectrum that are going into retirement. So it's not so much the younger people, which are you know, a lot of what we're seeing in our applications. So that's also good news that we might see change. But um, I think we're on the right track. So I think that's great. Yeah. Anyone have any other comments or questions? Well, I would just say, you know, I agree. If we think that in September things are going to get better in the labor market, you know, there's an interesting study that shows the, of the 20 states that repealed the extra benefit for unemployment um, versus the ex remaining states that still have it, there is uh, no difference in unemployment rates. So I don't know that we're going to have a windfall of people coming back off of work when this is all set, when this, when this benefit goes away. So. I think you're right. People um, experienced a pretty traumatic year, and they are unwilling to sell their labor sometimes at a price that might not be meaningful, or to do a job that they don't necessarily think is meaningful. And it'll be interesting to see how we negotiate that in the future. Mm -hmm. The times have changed. Yeah, I mean, I would add that the Michigan's unemployment rate is 4.8 um, percent. At before the pandemic, it was 3.9 um, percent, um, and so. I don't think it's that much higher than what it was pre-pandemic. At the height of the pandemic, it was 23%. Um, so I think we've come a long way, and I don't know that the issues with hiring is necessarily tied to unemployment. Okay, also we've been getting um, GFL still. If anyone has seen out there that we're looking at doing some adjustments, we're trying all kinds of different adjustments to see what works best for the residents. And Monday through Friday, they will be collecting trash and recyclables. And then on Saturdays, they will be able to take all the trucks and work on composting. So they're taking four extra trucks off of composting, and they're going to put it only for trash. And then we also have specialized recycling trucks. So we're going to see if that switch up helps some of our residents and get, get those collections up. We're always watching, and we're working with them every day. And of course, we, we get people calling still. So. Just to let you know, we're continually working with GFL, trying to do what's best out there. And that this Saturday is the first day that we're going to have Saturday pickup? I believe so, yes. Exciting. And I'm part of it because my compost has been sitting out there over for, for over a week also, so I, we all know what it's like out there. The philosophy behind that is to prioritize the sanitary trash pickup so it doesn't sit out at the curb for a long period of time and to do that by designating more drivers to solely focus on trash and recycling from Monday through Friday and then they would, so the extra day would be just for whatever's left over from a trash or a recycling standpoint and then the totality of the yard waste in Canton Township on Saturday. Correct, yes. And so you, wisdom in that, I think. There is. And then also you can put your trash into a 32-gallon bucket, too, to stop the rodents. I left a bag out the other day, and the animals got to it, so I learned my lesson. Get there. Yeah. I've seen the comments that people have said that they uh, do their yard work on Saturday. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, I have had a, a lawn refuse bag in my garage for about two months. So, uh, you know, that's an unfortunate thing, I guess. But yes. probably not the end of the world. Right, right. Also, the lawn clip. I, I used to have a guy who lived down the street from me who um, had the best yard in the, in the neighborhood. And he told me, um, he used the one, he said, keep your grass long because it protects the roots. And then two, mulch that, mulch that grass in back in there, especially with this Canton clay. You got you to gotta rebuild that soil. Mm -hmm. And he was right. He had the best lawn in the neighborhood. My lawn is not nearly the best <laughs> at all. My neighborhood, it's a competition. 
So, Greg, do you want to talk about some of the um, leisure services items coming up this week? Actually, we're, there's a Punjabi festival on Saturday. That's going to be at Heritage Park. And what else is uh, happening? There's also, um, as you may know, a uh, mini triathlon this Saturday in Heritage Park. Yes. Yeah, my daughter is participating in that. Oh, so am I. I'll look for her. <laughs> We have a guest of honor with the township supervisor uh, competing in our triathlon this weekend, so that's oh, exciting. No pictures. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be taking pictures. No. Uh -huh. um, and then uh, the biggest one is the picnic in the park coming up. Um, I'm going to blank out on the date, the 24th, August 24th. September. No, August. <laughs> Not Today, August. <laughs> September 24th, yes. Um, I'm going to double check that right now because it's the Friday. So, yes, it is September 24th um, for um, the fireworks celebration and some concerts in Heritage Park. And last week, um, Trustee Borninski and I witnessed the, um, the fire winning the police in a wing eating contest. So, sorry about that. But you did both <laughs> raise money for charities. <laughs> I was I'm a little bit worried about some of the, the <laughs> officers have, um, eating some chicken like they were. <laughs> but luckily, yeah. the police and fire were there, right? <laughs> All right, great. Anything else? Okay, can I have a motion to adjourn? Would it be appropriate to have the second round of public comment? Oh, yes. Yes, for that. that. Okay, beautiful. Then I move <laughs> to adjourn. We can have a third round. <laughs> Four. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Meeting adjourned.